This year's Mobile One British Rally Championship has a tough act to follow because the 1997 series was a cracker. Nissan's Mark Higgins survived this fright in the final stages of the final round to take the title after a five-way shootout in the Isle of Man. But his rivals, including 1996 champion Gwyndaf Evans, weren't so lucky. As the aerobatic Evans practiced precision parking, that gave Alistair McRae in the goal a chance of his second British title. But it wasn't to be. McRae and Evans are both back to fight for the 1998 championship crown, with a range of new rivals in a new-look season opener on the Silverstone Rally Sprint circuit. With the well-proven Volkswagen, McRae is a favourite. We do this as a bit of a warm-up. It counts for manufacturer's points, so it's going to be as competitive as the, as the stage rally, and I'm looking forward to Wales. I think we've got to be uh, there or thereabouts. The car was very quick last year in gravel, and we've got the new car coming out halfway through the year for the asphalt, so I'm fairly confident. <laughs> Evans has a new car and a new team. He's moved across to Formula 2 world champion Seat. It's coming together nicely. Yeah, I'm uh, slowly settling into the team and um, so far enjoying every minute of it. It's quite different to what I'm used to. The car's been put together differently. It's a very, very strong car. It's built for the world championship. Now we're trying to fine-tune it for, for myself to drive it and also for the British forests. It's very, very difficult to judge how competitive Myself and the car will be very early on until we put it against something else. I mean, you can do all the testing in the world and all the development, but until you actually put it against other teams, you don't really know how competitive. But I think realistically, we can, we can hope for podium finishes at least. And total commitment? Yeah, absolutely. The new lightweight Howard. See it. Put me in a bit of an awkward position, really, and said, uh, you're too heavy, big boy. And I still had to do something about it. So um, once I got my head around the fact that uh, I had to lose a bit of weight, it really wasn't as difficult as I anticipated. It was just it's the mental, the mental thing, physically actually doing it. Um, I, I sort of quite enjoyed because I've, I've become much more aware of my body and, and uh, started training. And um, I, I went out and um, bought a GT mountain bike, quite expensive one actually. So I had to justify buying it by using it. And, and consequently, I, I've managed to reach the target weight. How much weight have you lost? Well, I've actually person? lost just over four stone, actually, which is, which is, I suppose, a fair achievement in itself. But um, I feel better for it, and obviously the team's going to reap the benefits as well. Tapio Lokenen joins Martin Rowe, who now has a world champion co-driver, Derek Ringer. Yeah, we had a fairly good year last year, second in the championship, and there's been a lot of changes at Renault. Obviously, I've got a new co-driver, and um, we're going to try and better that second place and win the championship. Now, Derek's experience and knowledge is, you know, he's, he's been everywhere I want to go in the World Championship as well, so, you know, I'm going to make the most of that. Obviously, it's well since I've been in the British Championship, and uh, the last time I was here, Renault and some of the other manufacturers weren't competing, so it's, it's expanded, it's uh, much more competitive, and, and I'm very happy with the position I find myself in. And from round two, Vauxhall will return to the championship with Finn Yamo Kutaleto. I'm very pleased to be here again. And we have a new car, new model, and a new team. And uh, we are going to do our best. And Justin Dale gives the latest Peugeot 106 its British debut. It's been uh, quite entertaining, really. With, uh, as you probably know, the car sort of turned the wheel this morning. First of all, it's ever been on gravel, so uh, everyone was a bit optimistic what it could do. It's a bit lively. It's uh, a lot different to what I was driving last year. Um, it's got just over 200 brake horse, uh, so uh, a little 106. It um, takes some getting down on the road, that's the trouble. Malaysian car maker Proton joins the series with Jennifer Davies behind the wheel. Obviously, I, I'm new to the work scene, so is Proton. So, I mean, it's, it's worked really well. It's not like I'm being dropped in the deep end with a like, well-known manufacturer's team because I think I probably we feel a bit kind of stuck with that. Whereas um, with Proton, obviously, we're kind of going to be developing the car and I'm going to be helping with that. So I'm going to learn a lot from them and they're going to learn a lot from me, really. So it's going to like prove a point here. I think a lot of people have maybe got poor opinion of Proton, but I think as the year develops and from this weekend as well, they're going to have a change their opinions, really. The Simonites are three times ladies' champions. Now their targets are higher. This year it's going to be a little bit different. It's a bit more of an attack in us this year. We don't want to lose the ladies' title, but obviously if it happens, it happens because we're actually going to try and uh, attack more for the top, top ten position, really. Especially on the gravel. We've achieved it 
sort of quite good results on the tarmac, but not the gravel before, so that's our main aim this, this time. Hopefully we'll get a lot more testing under our belts. Um, it's like a tennis player, isn't it? Think how many hours they have to train to get that good. So hopefully we're going to really try this year and get loads of testing done and really sock it to them. <laughs> And the four-wheel drive production cup is always one of the most closely fought classes. You know, the production cup is a hardly fought cup that's going to be a real fight all the way through the year. We showed our hand last year, we showed we can win with the car. Uh, to a lot of people's amazement, and probably even mine, we're hopefully having a brand new car for Ulster, a new 205 style of car which has better brakes. The 17 sets of brake pads on the Isle of Man are winning the class. Luckily sponsored by Mintex, we've got away with that one, but if I had to pay out my own pocket, yeah, it would be hard work. But yeah, looking forward to the season. The pressure's on for the reigning champion. Last year, our main thing was to win the championship, and there were lots of times where we had to settle for second. We didn't want to risk the car, where, for a driver's point of view, nobody wants to, to finish second. So this year, it's just going to be, we're aiming for some high overall results in the gravel. We just need a little bit more safari rain over here at the moment, and then I would sit us down on the ground. Yeah, David came out on top and we've got to put that right this year and that means we've got to win it. He can only fall down. He, he can't do any better. If he wins, it's just, well, you won it last year, so what? And we can improve and it's going to be hard to improve, but that's the aim is to win. I mean, people say it's the taking part. It's not, not nowadays. You come in, the money you put into it, you've got to win and sometimes you don't, sometimes you do. I mean, that, that's just rallying. Uh, as long as we go away without any damage and a, a respectable result, there's no points at stake for us this weekend. It's pride, and we're the worst in the world for pride. You don't want the next man beating you, so we're next to David Higgins in the service area. We don't want them on a night tomorrow night going, hey, we beat you, we've got to beat them, and that's all there is to it. So on to the opening round of the 1998 British Rally Championship, held over two legs on the 1.2 mile Silverstone Rally Sprint course. We catch up with the first of the two knockout competitions, the morning runs, with over 5,000 fans braving the cold and the rain. For the first time in the series, two cars race together head-to-head -head in two separate lanes on both gravel and tarmac. Off the line, the cars take the two right-handers, then it's flat out down the hill with the red lane heading for the water splash, the blue lane for the yum. Next comes the hairpin with the inside having a shorter distance, and the blue lane should move ahead as the cars head for the Michelin Bridge. Blue lane takes the bridge, the other car takes the tunnel, and this is where the car in the red lane can fight back, the second lap of the circuit. This time the blue takes the water splash, the red the yum, and the tighter inside line at the hairpin. The driver in the blue lane will be watching for his opponent as he goes under the bridge, while the red will be making a last-ditch attempt over the jump and through the final right-hander to the finish line. And in the knockout finals, the first across the line is the winner. But the morning heat's proved it's not quite that straightforward, as the Finn Tapio Laukonen in the Renault and last year an Anderson in the Escort fought their own personal Nordic battle. It looked as if the Swede had the advantage by the yump. The Escort had the advantage now of the inside line all the way up to the bridge, but Laukonen was making up for his late start and catching up fast. Up to the bridge and over the yump for the young Swede, moving up to the Escort this season after driving the Ford car last year. But watch out for the very sideways fin in the Renault Megane. Back onto the tarmac and across the line for the first time, Anderson looked well ahead. No hazards like pine trees on this event, but there were unyielding Silverstone tyres. The steering joint broken, Anderson could only slide to a halt and watch Laukonen qualify for the semi-finals. Here the Finn would face a much tougher challenge, Alistair McRae in the Golf. The 1995 champion, very nearly the 1997 champion too, and one of the favourites for this season's title. As McRae controlled the Golf's wheel spin off the line, Laukonen was pushing hard, too hard at the opening corner. Only minor damage after that 70 miles an hour brush with the tyres, but Laukonen now had to recreate his own personal auto test before he could point the Megane in the right direction. And in the meantime, McCrave confirmed his place in the finals and a head-to-head -head with Gwyndaf Evans in the Seat. The Spaniards who build these cars have a name for this, Mano y Mano, man against man, between two of the quickest men in the British Championship. 
McRae in the Golf, an older car which will be replaced about mid-season. Evans in the brand new Seat Evo 2. Both cars fighting for grip with almost 300 horsepower from the two-liter engines going through those spinning front wheels. Up and over the bridge from McRae, the early leader as the cars completed the first lap. But now Evans had the inside line for lap two. And the Welshman was set to use every inch of the track and a bit more as he went on the attack. By the hairpin, Evans had equaled the score, but the Seat was fighting for traction on the tighter inside line, and that gave McRae the advantage once again. It was absolutely equal at the bridge. McRae in the tunnel, Evans at the yump. It was all down to the final corners on a treacherous, muddy tarmac surface. And as McRae slithered towards the Armco, it was Evans who was able to stay on full power and claim the first Mobil One British Rally Championship victory of the year. Winner of the first leg of the rally sprint, a great debut for Evans in the Seat team. And that win meant that Seat start the year at the head of the manufacturer's championship points with Volkswagen second, Renault third and Ford fourth, ahead of Peugeot, Vauxhall and Proton. But with points being scored in eight rounds this season, there's still a very long way to go. Jason Plato, playing on his own, playing with himself. But it wasn't just the rally drivers who were soaking up the action. Renault touring car race Jason Plato had been persuaded to drive a third Megane for a one-off appearance and his rally debut. I'm actually mud. Starting to look like a proper rally driver. Yeah. You enjoyed the morning? Yeah, yeah, I have actually. I mean, I'm a bit disappointed in myself. I didn't make the top eight. I missed out. I was ninth. But I've got 101 excuses. Why? Oh, the conditions changed. I only had one go in the dry. It rained. Uh, it wasn't quick enough. It's funny, you know, I said yesterday, this is just fun for me. But as soon as it all the watch starts ticking, it fun just goes out of it a little bit and you get more serious. So. I think we'll do better now, because at least the conditions are wet. And it's the same for everyone, it's not going to change. At least I've been around three or four times, so I'm a bit more confident now. I mean, I only missed out by half a second or something. I, did, I set my fastest time in the wet, so, you know, I was being a bit of a puff this morning, I think, in the dry. But yeah, we, we're going large. I do like this, uh, this water splash jumping type stuff. I think we should introduce them in the touring cars. But before the afternoon action, a very special moment, as the paddock went silent as a tribute to one of Britain's greatest motorsport personalities, the late, great Roger Clark. Judy, Roger's widow, along with sons Oliver and Matthew, were on hand with Lord Hesketh, president of the British Racing Drivers Club, to rename the course the Roger Clark Rally Stage in his memory. A fitting tribute to the man who won two RAC rallies in 1972 and 1976, and thrilled and inspired a whole generation of rally fans for over three decades at the top of his sport. Then it was on with the action. In the absence of the latest Astra, Peter Little was upholding Vauxhall honours with a factory development engine in his old ex-David Llewellyn car. It was proving more than a match for Adam Kent, driving last year's works Peugeot 306 S16. In the Ferodo Super 1600 class for the smaller, lighter 1600cc cars, Jennifer Davies was giving the new Proton a successful debut, but was outside the ranks of finalists as the cars lined up for the final heats. The top eight times from the quarter-final runoffs will go into the knockout semi-finals. Tapio Laukinen, the quickest, was paired with his Renault teammate Martin Rowe, while the second semi-final would bring together the old rivals Evans and McRae once again. Now, no need to look at the stopwatch. It was first across the line wins. Off the line for the two Renaults. Rowe number two on the inside, Laukinen number six on the outside, and it's neck and neck. More than just friendly rivalry here, the result might set the tone for the team for the whole season, as Rowe, in his second year with Renault, works to show his new team leader a thing or two. Rowe ahead at the hairpin, the winner of last year's Manx Rally, his home event. But Laukinen, beautiful car control, gets the power down better. Now he's moving 
ahead, but has the longer way round on the run to the bridge. Ronau seems to be in front, and he flies over the jump as Tapio Laukan and takes the tunnel, but the Finn now has the inside track. And look at the determined body language in car number two. Martin Rowe beautifully controlled at the grandstand turn, across the line, over four lengths ahead of Laukanen. But just look at the Finn's commitment. Can he close that gap? Inch perfect, onto the dirt, 90 miles an hour. Recruited from Volkswagen at the end of last season, Laukanen is set to do selected world championship rallies in the Megane, as well as the British championship. This is a true world-class driver giving 100% to catch Martin Rowe, and it's equal again. Laukanen alongside at the hairpin, and now he's got the shorter run to the bridge. Both cars fighting for traction. 300 horsepower going through those front wheels, and it's Laukanen sideways over the bridge, just ahead of Rowe through the tunnel. Through the left and the right, it's Laukanen now two lengths ahead, but Rowe's closing again, sliding into the final right-hander, a last-ditch effort. Laukanen's first to the line, Rowe bounces off the armco, he still makes it to the finish. And that means Tapia Laukanen is heading into the final. The question is, who will be his rival, Gwyndaf Evans or Alistair McRae? Evans won the first leg, McRae is now after revenge, but not if the Welshman's got anything to do with it. Total concentration, the lights go to green and McRae's goal slightly quicker off the mark, but Evans has got the inside line in the Seat. Onto the loose, a twitch of opposite lock for Evans, he's heading for the jump, McRae the water splash. And it's Evans just a second or so ahead on the run into the hairpin. Contrasting styles, McRae takes a wide line, trying to keep up the momentum. Evans, very tight, flicking the Seat sideways with a handbrake. And it's Evans' technique that works. Onto the shale, just ahead of McRae, braking with his left foot, full power on the right foot, keeping the back of the car sliding over the bridge. Huge jump from Evans, lands ahead of the golf, but now the Seat's on the outside. McRae's got the advantage. Really a performance from the Seat team. The new Ibiza Evo 2 is a lighter, more agile car than its predecessor. And Windaf Evans, a legendary development driver, is the ideal man to ensure it can finish the long, tougher events this season. Certainly has the advantage now on the Roger Clark Rally Sprint course. McRae's Golf slithering on the tarmac with understeer. The Seat seems much better balanced as Windaf heads for the water splash. Evans through the water, but McRae's literally flying on the run down to the hairpin. All four wheels on the grass at the entrance. Alistair's on a real do-or-die effort, and the Golf seems to have the advantage on the loose. Now the Golf's on the bridge. Evans approaching the tunnel. It's almost a dead heat. The Golf's bouncing between the tyres and the armco, but McRae keeps it all under control. The question is, where's Evans? He's right alongside. It's all down to the final corner. McRae sideways. Both drivers beautifully controlled. And McRae's engine dies on the line. Gwyndaf Evans is through to the final. McRae, the rev counter reads zero. He's coasting to a halt. Bitter disappointment for the misfiring Alistair McRae as Gwyndaf Evans lines up for his second final of the day. He'll be up against Tapio Laukonen in the Renault Megane. No, obviously disappointed. We finished, we get second points in the first, the first round this morning. It'd be nice to get some more points there, but... That's rally sprinting. <laughs> Better luck for Wales. Thank you. And before the Super Rally Car Final, the Class Finals. First, the Ferodo Super 1600 cars. Neil Weirden from Lancashire in the Honda Civic VTI. Justin Dale from Hampshire in the Peugeot 106 Maxi Kit car. Weirden slightly ahead. The Civic, a well-established and developed car, uses variable valve timing on its engine to rev to a stratospheric 9,000 RPM, gives over 200 horsepower from just 1,600 cc. Peugeot, literally brand new, straight from the factory. It had never even been driven before this morning, and the team have done a brilliant job around the inevitable teething problems. But at the jump, it's the Honda now well ahead, prepared for the Japanese company by Ask with Order Sport near Brands Hatch. Another example, like Subaru and Mitsubishi, of how British rally expertise is exported worldwide. In the Honda, the winner of the 1600cc class in last year's championship, a volunteer fireman when he's not rallying. And plenty for rally journalist Martin Sharp to write about after this ride in the co driver's seat, I am sure. Honda's engine howling now with a substantial lead over the Peugeot, but this Ferodo Super 1600 Cup could become the most hotly contested class in the British Championship as the Peugeot and Proton improve, and there are even reports that other manufacturers are joining up too. 
But in the meantime, Neil Weirden's having it all his own way. And to his credit, he isn't backing off and cruising. He's giving the spectators a brilliant sight and sound right on the limit. Through the tunnel, through the final corners for Neil Weirden. Heading for victory in the Ferodo Super 1600 Cup. And as the car heads for the line, just look for those huge smiles in the little Honda. Now the production cup finals. Julian Porter in the Mitsubishi Lancer with a standard heavier body shell than the Super Rally cars, but turbocharged four-wheel drive and stupendous acceleration off the line. But it's reigning champion David Higgins in the Subaru Impreza diving across, takes the lead and the inside line. No championship points at stake for production cup drivers, but as Porter said earlier, it's all about pride. And the former Manxman David Higgins, who now runs a rally school in Wales, is determined to hold on to that number one spot. Subaru has the advantage over the jump, two seconds ahead of Porter's Mitsubishi, but the County Durham driver is using every inch of the track, plus a little bit more. With these bigger, heavier cars, smoothness is important as aggression to get a quick time, but it's David Higgins out in front, and now there's confidence, even has time to flash the headlights at the photographers as he flies off the yump. But Julian Porter is charging hard in the background. There's no way, surely, he can close this gap. It's not for the want of trying, though. Sideways on the tarmac, brushes the barriers with his back bumper. Porter is literally driving the tyres off that Mitsubishi to stay in touch. But across the line already, onto the outside lane, David Higgins well in control. No damage to Porter's Mitsubishi, but Higgins looks set to win the Production Cup category in style. But not if Julian Porter's got anything to do with it. A wall of death around the hairpin, trying to take a very wide line to avoid using the handbrake, losing momentum. He's trying everything possible to fight back. Is this going to be Higgins' day, though, in the lead? Porter, very spectacular. Higgins, very precise and tidy. Both drivers on the absolute limit. And Higgins' lead is being eroded. He has the inside line for the final turn, but both drivers are right on the limit. Higgins is understeering. Porter is oversteering. A big twitch as the Mitsubishi throws up the dirt. The Subaru gets the advantage and victory in the production cup for an obviously delighted David Higgins, who takes a bow. Now to the big one, the grand final, Windef Evans on the left, Tapio Laukinen on the right. Manufacturer's points at stake, but more importantly, pride, and it's the Renault that gets the better start. But not for long, Windef Evans has the inside line, and he moves ahead on the run down to the jump. It's the green Seat over the ump just before the Renault hits the water splash. It's now into the hairpin. The track's drying out. There's more grip out of the corner. And that is working to Gwindap Evans' advantage. He's still just ahead now as they set off on the run to the bridge. But Laukonen is right with him. Riding with Evans and blinding sun as he flies over that yump at 100 miles an hour. Now onto the outside track. Laukonen in the Renault Megane, right up against the side of the tunnel, uses every inch of the stage. But it's Evans ahead onto the tarmac. Laukonen's right on the limit behind. Slides wide, all bounces off the barriers, back onto the track. Keeps going, though. Question is, has that now affected his rhythm? Oh, it certainly doesn't look like it, though. Laukonen's got the inside track now. He's closing on Evans as the Seat heads down to the water splash. Over the young for Laukonen, closing on Evans into the hairpin. This is going to be close. Handbrake on, trying to slide the tail of the Megane round, tighten his line through the corner, set himself up for the next one. But Evans is still ahead. Up to the tunnel, the Seat lead, but Laukonen's fighting back. The Renault flies over the bridge, the Seat goes through the tunnel. The Renault is making up ground on Evans. It's side by side into the final corner. Both drivers keeping it tidy. And it's the Seat getting its power down first. Yeah. Wind up Evans and Howard Davies win for Wales. Just bank, huh? Just he turned in. No, he, yeah, he, he lost it coming into that. Yeah, me in the cup. Yeah, yeah, me in the cup. Oh, yes, we won. But that's what he did. He lost it coming in there. And Evans reverting to his native Welsh in the excitement for a bilingual conversation with Howard Davies. I guess there's a bit of life still in him. I, uh, yeah, really happy. What warmed up to expectations? Yeah, um, it's, it's quite evident that the um, Cup of Sport boys have been working hard behind the scenes uh, since the RDC rally. and. Um, they're, they're doing a good job with the car. The car's getting more competitive all the time, and we've still got quite a bit of work on her. 
and um, it's looking good. It was indeed looking good for Evans and Seat, taking the lead of the Manufacturers' Championship by five and a half points from Volkswagen and Renault. But with the Silverstone Rally Sprint counting only for team points, the true challenges were still to come for the individual drivers, along with the chance for Peugeot, Vauxhall and Proton to show their true potential. First, though, there was still time for the main rivals to celebrate in the Silverstone sunshine. Round two of the Mobile One British Rally Championship was back on more familiar ground. The crews heading west to the Marches, the historical borderland between the Mersey and the mountains of North Wales. The Vauxhall Rally of Wales would use the classic forest stages of Snowdonia and Mid Wales, but the opening special stage was very different, on the banks of the Mersey at New Brighton near Liverpool. It was next to the Vauxhall factory which builds the new Astra, so where better for the new car to make its debut? It's very important to start. We must uh, get information from car and and uh, where is the setup and and everything. Uh, I don't expect excellent results from here. I I think we have to finish and uh, and that that's that's very important. Toledo's talent and the new Astra would be a fearsome combination. I've been here two times. In 95 uh, we was second and 96 we was third in F2. Forest roads it changed every year. I don't know how well I know, <laughs> but uh, of course I I like to get the first position. But uh, I don't I don't know if it's possible. A committed drive by Putolato on the opening Euro Wirral special stage saw the Astra claim the seventh fastest time. But the favourite for the Vauxhall Rally of Wales victory was undoubtedly the Seat of local hero Gwyneth Evans. Yeah, it's, it's very good really, I mean obviously it's won the World Championship two years running so it must be pretty good. Um, okay it wasn't completely suited for the British um, forests but I think we've done a bit of work on that score and hopefully we're going in the right direction on that score as well. I would hope that it'll be seconds that'll be separating four, five, possibly six drivers a game. But as the hard-charging Evans set the initial pace, his main rival was already waiting at the start. Alistair McRae in the Golf was set to match Evans' time to the second. I think Winda will be fired up. He's a new team. I've won his event three times. He'll be, he'll be determined not to let me do it a fourth time. Obviously, Tapio, uh, Martin Rowe, a, a lot of quick driver. Any news of what the stages are like? It's fairly dry. I it? think it's fairly dry. They've not had any rain here for a week or so, so it's got to be drying out a bit. Uh, there's a breeze there, so we'll see. The final countdown for McRae, but he and joint leader Evans knew that the two short tarmac stages were just a prelude to the real thing. West of Ruthin, Krakynog Forest beckoned. And as McRae predicted, dry, dusty and very fast indeed. <laughs> Three stages in Krakynog and one in Brennig would lead to the first service area and form the bulk of the opening day's action. McRae was the early pace setter, but not for long. Despite not feeling happy with the Seat steering, Evans was still a match for the Volkswagen speed. A second ahead after the first Krakynog stage, the Welshman was charging. Even a self-opening door wasn't going to stop Evans and Davies' charge, as the home hero moved seven seconds ahead of McRae after six stages. Evans' teammate, Scotswoman Barbara Armstrong, was also starting well, up to 10th place in a Seat, the early leader of the Ladies' Cup. 1997 Manx rally winner Martin Rowe had thought the worst when his Renault Megane limped through Euro Wirral with a misfire. Fortunately, though, it was cured for the Forests, allowing the Manxman to climb from ninth to fourth place, but his delay had cost him dear. He was now 30 seconds behind Evans and McRae. And it was in Krakenog that Renault new boy Tapio Laukman was showing his pace in the Megane. Despite a slow start on the opening stages, the Finn was now second. But another problem was becoming obvious. As Laukkonen was closing on the cars ahead, he was running into their dust, and life was becoming very uncomfortable indeed. Problems of a different nature were to reflect Ulsterman Philip Young, 10th in his escort. 
The dry stages were now getting polished smooth, and he was set to slide off the road and out of the rally on stage four. That left Stephanie and Rachel Simonite upholding Ford honours, as well as battling with Barbara Armstrong for the lead of the Ladies' Cup. Now with coaching from Women's World Champion Louise Aitken Walker OBE, the rally also marked the Yorkshire pairing's first full event in the 300 horsepower Escort kit car. Despite struggling with a troublesome gear linkage, Stephanie came out of Kokainog 11th overall and two seconds ahead in the Ladies' Cup battle. And the new Vauxhall Astra was proving incredibly competitive right out of the box. The rally car, which was actually launched a week before its road-going equivalent, was so new it had only been driven four days before the rally start. And most of the suspension settings had been arrived at after testing on one private special stage. Despite that, Kutaleto was already up to eighth place and climbing. An amazing performance. Despite giving away almost 100 horsepower to the 2.0-litre Formula 2 cars, Neil Weirden's 1600cc Honda Civic was closing on the top 10 as well as dominating the Ferodo Super 1600 class. And the Lancastrian fireman was using every one of the Honda's 9,000 revs. Things weren't going so well for Weirden's Super 1600 rivals. The protons of Jenny Davies and Swedish teammate Mats Andersson were both set to retire after engine failures. Meanwhile, Hampshireman Justin Dale in the Peugeot 106 was fighting back after fuel pump problems. It was a tough debut for the French pocket rocket. Its engine was still tuned for flat-out continental tarmac rallies, and its all-or-nothing throttle response was giving Dale wheel spin even in sixth gear. Another highlight of the seventh and eighth stages of the day in Penmacno Forest was a fantastic battle between the Group N production cup cars. They still have turbochargers and four-wheel drive, but their production all-steel bodywork means they're heavy and a lot harder to slow for the tight turns. Chasing Johnny Milner's Toyota in 10th was Jeremy Eason, ninth in the Mitsubishi, demonstrating the braking problems. Just five seconds has separated Eason from the Finn Marco Ipati as they entered Penmacno, but now Ipati was ahead by three seconds to claim eighth overall and third in the production class. But ahead of them was an epic battle for the class lead. David Mann in the Proton Persona had fought a day-long duel with the Subaru of David Higgins. The Proton went into Penmacno just one second behind, but who would come out with a class lead and fifth place overall? The answer was Higgins, with headlamps ablaze, the younger brother of last year's British champion Mark stormed through the two stages to open a 27-second production class lead. Ahead of him were just the Formula 2 cars, but what a battle there. Martin Rowe was heading for the regroup at the famous Sportsman's Arms near Denby, happy with a well-earned fourth place. But it was an unhappy and worried Gwyndaf Evans, limping out of Penmacno third. A sick engine note provided the explanation, but was it an easily cured electrical fault or something more serious? Evans' loss, though, was Tapio Laukonen's gain. The Finns' Renault Megane was now up to second place, with just two short stages at Euro Wirral remaining before the overnight halt. But there was no doubting the fastest man in Penmacno. Alistair McRae's Volkswagen had taken no less than a 13-second advantage over Laukonen to jump from third into the rally lead. But the question was, as McRae and Evans arrived at the service areas, would Evans have been quicker than McRae? Indeed, was Evans still in the rally? On the last uh, stage, the, um, the, there's some bad misfire in the engine. Um, hopefully it's not nothing terminal. I, hopefully the boys can sort it out. But we did lose about 26 seconds. And, you know, since there's only seconds splitting us on the stages, I mean, 26 seconds is quite a lot to give away, but um, we'll see. Windup ponders what might have been, as does Peugeot driver Justin Dale. It's been a bit eventful from the word go this morning, going to the uh, start of the actual rally and the fuel pump packed up, so uh, we had a few road penalties before we even started, but um, the first few tarmac stages were brilliant, it's a real good tarmac car, it's the first time the car's ever been on gravel, so uh, it's been an uphill struggle from the word go, but it's, it's coming together now, we're the last two stages in Penmacno, uh, we really had a go and uh, quite a competitive time, so it's looking good. So the overnight leaderboard after 10 special stages, with Alistair McRae ahead of Tapio Laukonen, in turn just a second ahead of the recovering Evans, and Martin Rowe fourth.
but Saturday's seven stages would change the whole shape of the event. An epic fought out on classic mid Wales stages, their names legends in themselves. Maharin, Sweetlam, Hafran, Panpertog, Dovi, Garthiniog and Dovnance. First on the road, Alistair McRae trying to balance pace with the minimum of risk to capitalise on his overnight lead. In Lauchland's Renault, on the opening stage at Meherin, the opposite attitude, attacking from the word go. Just six seconds at stake, seven stages, 95 stage miles left to take the lead. Not full pace notes on this event, just safety notes produced by the organisers. So co-driver Tapio Yavi could only call the most hazardous corners. Amazingly, no signs of major damage as Laukonen quickly hit the starter button after a 90 mile an hour spin on a single track gravel road. But watch the left side of the Magan's windscreen. The billowing steam was a sign of a broken radiator, and although the Finn was quickly back up to rallying speed, the battered Renault couldn't maintain it for long. Before the end of the stage, the temperature gauge was off the clock and Laukonen out of the event. That left Gwyndaf Evans heading the pursuit, and the Welshman had emphatically left his overnight problems behind him. McRae had completed the 15-mile Meheran stage in 15 minutes 25 seconds. Evans' time was a stupendous 15 minutes 18 seconds, making him equal rally leader with McRae. The battle moved on to stage 12, Sweet Lamb, but as the Seat dived into the forest, Evans was becoming more and more concerned with its steering. And the sudden lurch to the right was the result of one front wheel steering in each direction. Instead of suddenly fighting for the lead, Evans and Howard Davies were fighting to stay in the event. As Evans ground to a halt, the spectators were ready to help wherever they could. And I suspect they'd carry their hero's car to the end of the stage if necessary. One wheel is steering. We have three and a half miles to go. Is it okay to take the wheel off and drive out to the stage without a front wheel? Over. Here you brace. Here you brace. Yes, in the car. Where is it? Well, how about the sitting? Have you got service on the phone? <laughs> When the wheel came off, Evans discovered he could reassemble the steering components and finish the stage, although over 10 minutes had passed and with it any hope of a top position. Seat's bad news too continued, as the second car lost valuable time for a very different reason. Barbara Armstrong had started the stage 11th and back in the lead of the Ladies' Cup, but that would change when she made this complete bolognese of the Sweet Lamb hairpin. <laughs> And despite the best efforts of the spectators, it must have seemed to Barbara that her embarrassing moment was going to go on forever and ever and ever. Luckily, damage only to pride rather than to the car. But lost time meant that you would drop back, not only behind the Subaru of Simon Redhead in car number 41, but more importantly, behind the Simonites into 13th place and second in the ladies' class. This will be a corner that will haunt poor Barbara for years to come. Another driver suffering a momentary loss of direction was Marco Ipati, now seventh overall and third in Group N. But he had a quick way of recovering. At the head of the field, Martin Rowe had now taken up the pursuit for Renault and was in second place. He was 32 seconds behind McRae after Sweet Lamb, 30 seconds behind after Hafren. The Scotsman couldn't relax his pace. 
And the question was now, could Road put on enough pressure to force McRae into a mistake? In this rally, as we've seen so often, a 30-second lead means nothing if you suffer a mechanical problem, a puncture, or just slide off the road. Yama Hutaleto is now enjoying a superb debut drive that had taken the Vauxhall Astra up to fifth on the leaderboard. The Finn's satisfaction and the team's smiles were growing wider with every mile. In contrast to the worried faces in the Seat service area at McCuncliffe, co-driver Howard Davies took up the story. We had a pretty good run on the very first stage this morning, Meherin, but we went into Sweet Lamb and the front steering actually loosened itself and, and started to come apart. Um, we thought we'd complete the stage, but the wheels slowly went you know, out of direction and eventually it actually came apart and one wheel was steering and the other wasn't. So we stopped in the stage, jacked it up with some spectators' help. We managed to thread the parts back together and we got going. And obviously you lose confidence in the car after something like that, that's happened. So we, we've just driven through the last stage and we've got here now for them to give it a good span and check and check it over. Hopefully we can, um, we can continue and get some points now, but I mean, the challenge for the lead has um, unfortunately evaporated. This rally isn't good for me actually in Gwindow, is it? At it's all? not, we, is it? We have no. this interview quite often in this car park, <laughs> saying the same thing. Thanks very much, <laughs> but bad luck. Yes, yes, but you know, hopefully you get your own back on the Scots. Well, that's it, yeah, it's a bit of a Celtic battle, yeah. isn't it? No such problems for Alistair McRae. The golf arrives in service with a 30-second lead and four stages to go before the finish. Wind up we went very quickly in the first stage this morning. Uh, took us by a bit of surprise. We had a, a real go in the second stage and Gwyndaf had a problem. He's dropped, I think, 10 minutes. Uh, and Tapi went off as well. So it's just the, the pace we're driving at. It's very easy to make a mistake. Why well, are you smiling about all this? I'm not smiling at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just obviously it takes the pressure off me a bit. We backed off a bit in the last one and uh, Martin took two back, so maybe we just need to step the pace up slightly. Still four stages to go, so it's a long way. Is it? I would have thought that with your lead, you know, it was fairly cotton dry. No, <laughs> definitely not. You <laughs> should never say things like that. McRae's caution proved justified, despite setting the fastest time on the next stage under the scrutiny of his father, the 1979 Rally of Wales winner Jimmy. By the end of stage 15, Dovey, it was all over. A stone had held the radiator, the golf had boiled dry, and Alistair was out of the event. Yama Kutaleto's impressive drive too was set to come to a premature end. On stage 14, Pant Pertog, Yama was watching the temperature gauge climbing higher and higher. Car was running perfectly, but now he was smelling hot oil. And despite dropping his pace, he couldn't get the car to the end of the stage. Wisely shutting the engine down before serious damage was done, the reason became quickly obvious to the team. Another rogue piece of flying Welsh flint. So what do we think it is, a stone? Yeah, it's a stone. Big rock. From the rear, it uh -huh. went like this. Uh -huh. And uh, and uh, when we turning right, I I smell it. Yeah. 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 And uh, I think it when when we came down, I when I found it, the temperature went high. I I think it's uh, head gasket. Do you think it'll run with the new radiator or, or is the engine cooked? Mm, no, but it. No pressure in the piston. No, no, no pressure. Yeah. That seems pretty terminal. <laughs> I think so. Yes. Vauxhall Motorsport boss Mike Nicholson was Jimmy McRae's winning co driver on the 1979 rally, but not so lucky today. Also out of luck, David Higgins in the Subaru jammed in second gear for the long 16 mile Dovey special stage, losing the production cup lead and what would now be second place overall to the proton of David Mann. With no service between Dovey and the following Gothenyog stage, the unlucky Higgins was forced to drive over 30 miles in second gear, with the poor Subaru revving its heart out. In the stage before the last one, Dovey, we lost fourth gear originally, and then from once that was going, we were just bypassing fourth gear for a while, and it wasn't too much of a problem. And then we, the box jammed in second gear, and we've had to do the last two stages, probably the fastest stages in the country in second gear, so we've, we've dropped about six minutes now, but it's... It was a bit of a disappointment because we were up into second overall. The team and the car, everything was going 
absolutely 100%. Like normally you can spot the gears when they start to balk or something before they go, but this time it, it just went straight away. But hopefully we showed them that we are um, a little bit quicker on this rally and just hopefully we can sort it out now and come back for the, the probably when there's more points on offer. Still plenty of support for Gwendaf Evans, but at the head of the field, it was a delighted Martin Rowe. Second, David Mann in the production Proton Persona, his best ever result. Third, Johnny Milner in the venerable Toyota Celica, a fine drive against all odds. And fourth, the giant killing Honda of Neil Weirden, also dominating the Ferodo Super 1600 class. And just behind the troubled David Higgins, sixth overall for the production class Mitsubishi of Julian Porter. And a dramatic finish to the rally for Gwyndaf Evans. Four fastest times on the final four stages brought him from 24th place to an eventual seventh. A valuable championship points and perhaps a moral victory. Eighth overall for Stephanie and Rachel Simonite in the Escort. Winners of the Ladies Awards by just over two minutes. In ninth place, Simon Redhead and Alan Thomas. Gaining fifth place in the Production Cup category in their Subaru. While in tenth place, the memories of that disastrous hairpin in Sweet Lamb are sure to come back to haunt Barbara Armstrong. But a top ten position and second in the Ladies' Cup is not all bad. But the spectators at the final stage of the event were waiting for the rally leader. Martin Rowe, co-driven by former world champion Derek Ringer, had once again proved that smoothness and consistency pay. Fastest on just three of the 17 special stages, but bringing a pristine, almost unmarked Renault Megane Maxi to the finish of the Vauxhall Rally of Wales with a two minute, 10 seconds advantage, it's a delighted and relieved Martin Rowe who received the congratulations of the Renault team. Well done, mate. The pressure of that final stage, where he knew the rally could be lost but never won, was obvious on Rowe's face. He's sitting up on it in the car. Yeah, okay, go on ahead. Martin. Thank you. That must have been nerve-wracking that last stage. Though. Yeah, it was a horrible stage to finish on. It was very rough where they've regraded the, the stage in big, like, four-inch rocks. So first thing you think is uh, punches and things. So I'm you know, just glad to get it through. Drove in the middle of the road and the car felt awful, but it was just the, me probably. Just glad to get it over and done with. Rowe expressing relief at winning. David Mann, undiluted delight at finishing second. But we just kept it steady all day. I mean, David was going quicker than us this morning. We were going as quick as we could go, but couldn't keep up with him and just stuck at our own game plan, and it worked out very well in the end. But there was definitely no cruising for Johnny Milner in the old Toyota, still on the limit right to the very end. Even despite this spin, it was a fantastic third for Milner. A superb fourth, too, for Neil Weirden and Trevor Agnew in the Honda Civic. Sheer speed plus consistency makes him the man to beat in the Ferodo Super 1600s. Fantastic, can't believe it. You know, to, we came here, you know, hoping to get a top ten result uh, and hopefully win the Ferodo Super 1600 Cup. Uh, we've, we've done that and we've finished fourth overall, second in Formula 2. It's absolutely fantastic. Fantastic for me and Trevor and also the team. And eighth overall for the Simonites in Wales means that the men had better watch out as well as Barbara Armstrong. Yeah, absolutely thrilled to be. So at last we got into the top ten and we've had a good good run all the way through and we've been pushing hard like we said we were going to do and we've come out unscathed. So confirmation then of the results with Martin Rowe taking that victory by two minutes and ten seconds from David Mann, Johnny Milner third and Neil Wilden fourth.
David Higgins in fifth place, surviving that gearbox problem ahead of Julian Porter, with Gwyndaf Evans up to seventh, and the Simonites eighth. And Martin Rowe leads the Drivers' Championship points ahead of Neil Weirden and Gwyndaf Evans, with only the drivers of the front-wheel drive cars eligible to score. And with two rounds completed in the Manufacturers' Championship, it's Seat with 60 points to Renault's 58 and a half. Behind them, it's Ford, Peugeot, Vauxhall, Volkswagen and Proton. So once again, a spectacular Vauxhall Rally of Wales, with a dramatic result. Onwards and upwards for the Mobile One British Rally Championship, heading north to Carlisle, Cumbria and the Pirelli International Rally, based principally around the fearsome Kielder Forest. With dust, blind corners and deep ditches, Martin Rowe knew as well as anyone that good luck as well as good strategy would be critical, as he left the start ramp at Carlisle Airport. was the same as the Vauxhall Rally, we want to be in the first three at the end of the first day today and bag some more points obviously and then tomorrow, depending on how today goes, we might push to go for an overall victory but we'll just see how it goes. As many of Rowe's rivals hit bad luck in Wales, Alistair McRae was probably the unluckiest. Rowe's went really well to start with, uh, but then for the tyre, two stages from the end with engine failure, with 40 seconds lead it wasn't very good, but hopefully we can right that wrong here. It was just a bit luck. I mean, uh, my co driver he was just a half second behind the notes, and <laughs> that's all. It was too much. There is, it's always been uh, so much losing stones, big stones. You never know if you get the puncture, you're out of the rally. But uh, still, uh, Michelin has done a lot of work with the tires. I'm very pleased by that, and I'm looking forward to this event. The opening stages at the airport were just a prelude to what was to come. In Wales, you can, you can slide wider, use, use the ditches, use the road a bit more, use more of a line, whereas here, the roads are narrow, uh, there's steep ditches and a lot of rocks at the side, so it does make it a bit more difficult. Today, obviously, we've got three main stages, so there's quite a bit of pressure. One mistake in any of those stages or a, a punch in, you're going to be right down the field, and there's not many opportunities to pull back any time left, so we're going to be going pretty quickly, but you've got to be very careful. Long stages, you can't afford to make any mistakes because otherwise you're just straight into the ditches. So uh, you've got to be quite precise with your driving, and uh, hopefully, the Peugeot is going to keep me on the straight and narrow. Sharing the fastest times with McRae and Rowe on the opening stages, Gwyndaf Evans in the Seat had his sights on the championship lead. Meanwhile, his teammate Barbara Armstrong had the same goal to beat her rivals in the Pirelli Ladies' Cup the Ford crew of Stephanie and Rachel Simonite. But already the rally was beginning to bite. A mistake on the Carlisle stage dropped Vauxhall's Yamo Kutaleto to the tail of the top ten. But the serious business was already beginning 20 miles to the east in Europe's largest man-made forest, surrounding Kielder Water on the border between England and Scotland. Three special stages in Kilder Forest would complete the opening day's action, and the man to beat on the first of these, the 36.5-kilometre Churton head stage, was Martin Rowe in the Renault. Obviously, the conditions were ideal for the Megans. Tapio Lauknen was second fastest on the stage, just three seconds behind the rally leader. But the Finn was obviously not being intimidated by the giant Kilder ditches.
less happy, though, was Gwyndaf Evans. The Seat Ibiza was 15 seconds slower than the Renaults, and the Welshman was noticing a misfire out of the slower corners. was still third overall, three seconds ahead of the ever-spectacular Finn, Yama Kutaleto, who was storming his way back up the leaderboard after that mistake at Carlisle Airport. This was just the second event for the new Vauxhall Astra, but already the car was right on the pace. Less fortunate, though, was Alistair McRae. He was losing time dropping down the order to 8th place, and the gentle braking was a clue as to why. A flying stone had smashed a brake pipe, and the pedal was slowly sinking to the floor. Frantic pumping to keep the pedal pressure and the brakes on the Golf. Rutland driver Jeremy Eason, 5th overall, was heading the production cab category in his Group N four-wheel drive Mitsubishi Lancer Evo 4. After previous domination of the class by Subarus, this year the Lancer looked set to be the car to beat, but there were just a handful of seconds in it. Johnny Milner and his venerable Toyota Celica was just two seconds behind Eason after stage three, but already the car's temperature gauge was running in the red, and the Yorkshireman was forced to drop his pace and feed the car with gallons of water to make it to the end of the day. Third in the production cup and ninth overall, Gavin Cox was just six seconds behind the class leader in his Mitsubishi, but he was being rapidly caught by David Mann in his Proton Persona. The Suffolk driver had lost over 30 seconds and as many places with a spin on Carlisle Airport, but a storming recovery had him already back in the top 10. Chris Steen was a surprise early leader in the Ferodo Super 1600 class. His Skoda Felicia X-Works kit car outpacing both championship leader Neil Weirden's Honda and the factory Peugeot of Justin Dale. The Swedish driver was just 18 seconds slower than the Renault Megans in Cherden Head, climbing to an amazing seventh place overall as the cars headed for service in Hexham, with a short 30-minute respite for the drivers before two of the classic super-fast Kielder stages, Falston and Kursop, both 30 kilometres long. And immediately there was a change at the head of the leaderboard. A storming drive by Tapio Laupinen took him through Falston, a full 10 seconds ahead of his Renault teammate Rowe, and into the rally lead. The Finn had gambled on a different tyre compound, and it obviously worked, aided by the classic Laukonen 100% commitment. In contrast to Laukonen's attack, Martin Rowe, with the calming influence of world champion co-driver Derek Ringer alongside him, was concentrating on keeping it smooth, tidy and mistake-free. He would still leave Falston in second place, seven seconds behind his teammate and in a good point-scoring situation to reinforce his championship lead. And from a championship point of view, the Pirelli International Rally is effectively two events in one. Each of the two days is classed as a separate event for point scoring, with the two leaderboards then combined to give an aggregate overall winner. And that might be good news for the Renault's rivals. Gwyndaf Evans Seat was resisting all attempts to cure its misfire. Evans started Falston three seconds ahead of Kutaleto in the Astra, but by the end of the stage, the positions were reversed, with the Finn moving up to third place, a second ahead of the Welshman. But there was some consolation for Seat in the Ladies' Cup. Championship leaders Stephanie and Rachel Simonite were struggling with the handling of their escort, which was wandering from side to side on the heavily cambered Kielder tracks. Four crests, six states, crest and one right, one thirty up. Straight black crest, one thirty, three left, don't cut. One hundred, three left, don't cut, one hundred. Stay right over, small crest, 60, tight, 5 left, 60 now, tight, 5 left. In contrast to the Simonites' lack of confidence in their car, Barbara Armstrong was revelling in the handling of hers. 
The Scotswoman Seat was now over a minute ahead of the Simonites and rubbed the point home further by overtaking the similar escort of Philip Young on the penultimate stage of the day. Less lucky was Jenny Davies in the Proton Compact. Her troubled season continued with a puncture followed by a collapsed jack on the third stage of the day, then an encounter with an earth bank on stage four. Another driver having a tough time was Justin Dale in the Peugeot Maxi. Now on the edge of the top 20, not only was Dale still having to fight with nervous handling on the pocket rocket, he was also having to cope with fluctuating oil pressure and rising temperatures. It was proving a frustrating day for the Hampshireman. Right, two, 200. But on a 1 to 10 of frustration, Alistair McRae must now have been scoring 20. From thoughts of victory, the Scot was now struggling in 11th place. The brakes had now been repaired, only to be replaced by throttle problems, stopping the Golf from giving its full 280 horsepower. At least a philosophical McRae could look forward to scoring points on the second day of the rally. There's a clip come off the throttle cable, so we only had quarter throttle for the whole stage, so not good. It's not been your day today, really, has it? No, not at all. In the first stage, it was a, a rock's broken a brake pipe, uh, so we had no brakes for 10 miles of the stage. Then in there, we've dropped another minute, so disaster. But there was some good news in Cumbria. The Swede, Chris Sistine, was consolidating his position with a steady run to the end of the day. Although his Ferodo Super 1600 rivals were chipping away at his 45-second advantage, he was still set for class victory and 10th place overall. A stupendous battle in the production cup saw five cars covered just by 35 seconds. And the Finn Marco Ipati set the fastest time on the last stage of the day to claim fifth in class, ninth overall. But through the day, he'd been outpaced by a young compatriot. Jana Tohino from Kilminki was making his British rally debut. Fourth in class, eighth overall. But there were three British drivers at the head of the production cup battle. Gavin Cox, seventh overall in his Lancer Evo 4, distinguished by its bigger rear airfoil on the car's first visit to Kielder. Ahead, David Mann in the Proton Persona had produced one of the drivers of the rally to storm up the leaderboard after his spin on the opening stage to fifth overall. He was leading the class after stage four, but the Suffolk driver hadn't reckoned on a fight back on the final stage of the day from Jeremy Eason. Two seconds quicker through Kurzup, he claimed fifth place and the class win by just a second. And the battle for the lead was just as dramatic. Tapio Laukonen was in trouble, limping out of the final stage with damaged bodywork and a puncture after clipping a bridge. The Finn lost just 13 seconds, but that was enough to drop him from first to fourth within sight of victory. One can only imagine the atmosphere inside that car. It was up to third place by a margin of just a second for Yama Kutaleto in the Astra, a superb result in only the car's second event. The new car's handling was still not perfect, though, and Kutaleto was using every ounce of his awesome car control. That momentary off by Kutaleto almost certainly handed second place to a relieved Gwyndaf Evans. The team had cured the Seat's misfire by replacing the electronic ignition control and Evans repaid them by snatching second place by a one second margin. Evans' late charge brought him to within just four seconds of the rally lead. Ahead of him, Martin Rowe's cool, calm and collected strategy had almost come to grief when the Renault driver had overshot a junction on the last stage of the day, losing eight seconds. And that meant that the last part of the 30-kilometer Kurzob stage had to be driven ten-tenths. <laughs> But despite the pressure, Rowe duly delivered and returned to Carlisle, a relieved winner of the opening leg. We were just discussing with Derek on the way back. It's been a very short rally. Um, there's only been three main stages. And uh, basically, I've, I've just driven in the centre of the road and kept out of trouble again. And it's paid off. I've made a few mistakes. I don't feel I particularly drove very well, but the cars performed very well. The tyres have worked well. So 
you know, we're here, we're putting again. And as work began on the preparations for leg two, Windath Evans was happy with his recovery in leg one. Yeah, not too bad in the last stage, although we did overshoot the junction. I think it could have been quite a good stage time otherwise. But um, yeah, at least, at least the car ran um, OK on the last stage, and um, we managed to salvage second, so that's quite good. But Yama Kutaleto's achievement, third in the Astra, wasn't achieved without a few battle scars. The result is good, then, but uh, we lose the winning on the second stage. We spun and lose uh, six or seven seconds. It's uh, big difference after the Vauxhall Sport Rally and, and uh, we have done a lot of work but uh, we have a lot of work still to do but uh, it's coming. But what went wrong for Tapio Laukonen on that dramatic last stage of the day? On the last stage uh, we slightly start to bridge, narrow bridge and uh, our front, front wheel and uh, we got it to puncture and then it also broke the lower arm. We lost something like half a minute on the last stage. And the lead? Yes, of course, but still uh, we have one, one day to go and uh, now the gap is only six seconds to Martin, so it's not so bad. David Mann must have thought he had his class victory in the bag, but he reckoned without Jeremy Eason. We knew we was the second behind going into that stage, so we, we sat at the start, but shall we have a go or shall we have a second, second? But we had a bit of a go in there and we just managed to get it by one second. Very close. Barbara Armstrong and co-driver Lisa Audi were celebrating success over the Simonite sisters in the Pirelli Ladies' Cup. Took the time in the first two stages in the airport after last year's missed here, so we took a time there. And then in the gravel stages, um, I knew it would be OK because we had been out to a thing, Gwinda testing. So even though it was like very marble and a lot of cover, it didn't put me off, I wasn't scared of it or anything. So we had a few moments, so I settled down a bit, and then just tried to keep up the pace and just look for the difference in surface. So when it's nice and smooth, I went fast. And when it, we had these big rocks and stuff, I just like took my time with it. You can't win them all, can you? And there's another day tomorrow, so it's not the end of the world. Uh, we just haven't been a bit very confident with the car today. It's been uh, very tail happy and, you know, with the conditions, we been quite slipping. I'm just settled at the all today. But uh, I'm not asleep tonight and I'll be coming out fighting again tomorrow. Well, at least you don't look too unhappy about it. Well, it's even Stevens now. Even Stevens in the point, so tomorrow will be another day, as Scala O'Hara once said. <laughs> indeed, indeed. But at the end of day one, it's Martin Rowe heading the leaderboard with Gwyndaf Evans just four seconds behind. A second adrift from that, Yama Kutaleto and Tapio Laukonen makes it the top four. And in the championship points, that means Martin Rowe now extends his lead to 64 points over Evans 53. An 11 point advantage with Neil Weirden, the 1600 class man, heading Barbara Armstrong, third and fourth. Stephanie Semenite's fifth, Justin Dale sixth, Yama Kutaleto moves up to seventh ahead of Michael Faulkner. And in the Manufacturers' Championship, Renault lead by a mere two and a half points from Seat, with Ford and Vauxhall third and fourth. Behind Peugeot in sixth place, though, the reigning champions Volkswagen still have a long way to go. But there was still half the rally to go. Leg two would offer almost double the stage mileage and another chance to claim championship points based on the day's results, as well as the overall Pirelli International Rally victory calculated on aggregate. And to make Kielder still trickier, it was raining as the cars headed for the first and the longest stage of the day, the 25-mile, 40-kilometre trail through Pondershaw. <laughs> Setting the pace, Alistair McRae was going for broke, Fighting back after his problems on leg one left him 11th on the overnight leaderboard. He covered the stage in just 22 minutes and 40 seconds to head the leg two results and vault to fourth in the overall rally standings. Behind the flying McRae, Windaf Evans had no need to match the Scots breakneck pace. He was still going fast enough though to gain a six second advantage over Martin Rowe and take the overall rally lead by two seconds. But on stages where mistakes cost minutes, anything could still happen. Yama Kutaleto had high hopes of maintaining his top three position, even challenging for victory. But just a few kilometers into the opening stage of the day, there was a vibration, followed by violent tugging on the steering. A quick stop to check the situation, but it wasn't a puncture. It was a broken brake disc, as Kutaleto was to discover at the very next corner.
Blast on the horn for help, and the Astra was able to limp out of the stage using just the handbrake. But over 15 minutes were lost, and with it, any chance of a front running position. Another driver to lose time and a chance of honours was David Mann. He slithered off the road three miles from the end of the stage and lost almost 30 minutes before continuing at the tail of the field. In contrast, Jana Tohino was driving a storming stage on his first ever visit to Pundashore. As a result, the young Finn jumped into the production cup lead and fifth place overall, just 10 seconds behind Alistair McRae. Martin Rowe, meanwhile, was refusing to be flustered by all the heroics around him. Although losing time to McRae and Evans, he was happy to play the tortoise to the hare. After all, his strategy had paid off on day one, he was championship leader and still second in the aggregate results. In contrast, Tapio Laukonen was reinventing the words maximum attack, used regularly by Finnish drivers of years gone by. His charge kept him ahead of McRae in third place and just six seconds behind rally leader Evans with three stages to go. In the Pirelli Ladies' Cup, though, the pendulum of fortune was starting to swing against Barbara Armstrong after her overnight success. She was still 16th overall on aggregate, two places ahead of the Seminites. But the Seat was starting to lose ground against a rapidly improving Ford. The Simonites had softened the suspension of the Escort and chosen softer compound rear tyres to improve its handling, and the combination was producing results. But despite the Yorkshire sisters' best efforts, it wasn't enough to make up that 1 minute 50 seconds overnight deficit. Four left over the crest, 100. Two left continues, 100. In the Ferodo Super 1600 battle, Christa Steen was now fighting to maintain his day one advantage. After a slow start, championship leader Neil Weirden was now well in the groove in his Honda Civic, and the Lancastrian was set to climb from 12th to 8th overall, overtaking the Swede on the way and holding on to third in the overall driver's points. Although Proton's compact were again suffering a spate of engine failures, Jenny Davies at least was providing some hope for the team, heading to third in the Ladies' Cup, 33rd overall but it was proving a tough rally for Justin Dale in the Peugeot. The car was originally designed for smoother French rally stages, and the original gravel specification suspension supplied with the car actually raised its ground clearance only by an inch, hardly ideal in Kielder. The British Peugeot engineers quickly developed their own suspension, but on stage eight of the rally at Rickerton, Dale all of a sudden had too much clearance under the car. 40. The shout for help was to roll the car back onto its wheels, but as Dale tried to start the engine, it was in vain. The crankshaft pulley had been snapped off by the impact and the car was out of the event. Meanwhile, in the production cup, Marco Ipati stormed ahead of his rivals to take the class win by a 16 second margin on the final stage. The Finn also moved up to fifth place overall, both in the day two results and in the overall aggregates, despite this little indiscretion, which lost him over 30 seconds. <laughs> if Putty should thank those rapidly intervening spectators for giving him that class victory. of Ipati on Newcastleton, the ninth and last stage of the rally, Alistair McRae was heading for fourth place on aggregate in the Volkswagen. He'd also get 28 championship points for second place on day two of the event. There was no way he could catch Gwyndaf Evans for the rally lead, but it was a great salvage job after a disastrous opening leg. The last stage of the rally was, of course, where last year the top three runners, McRae, Evans and Roven Perra, all crashed out of the event while fighting for the lead. This year, though, discretion seemed to be the better part of valour, for Martin Rowe at least. He was happy to let his teammate move up to second and would hold third on the road and on aggregate and keep a one-point lead in the drivers' championship. Tapio Laukonen's fight back through the closing stages took him to within 20 seconds of the flying McRae, third place in leg two. 
But more important is the consistency which added up to second place overall on the Pirelli International and now places him fourth in the Drivers' Championship ahead of his Scots rival. But there was no doubting the overall winner of the 1998 Pirelli International Rally. Gwyndaf Evans had overcome his day one problems, set the pace nearly all the way through day two, and this year avoided any trouble on the final Newcastleton stage to give the Seat team a historic first ever British Rally Championship outright victory. Evans and the Seat have of course won the rally sprint, but this is the first time they've tasted victory in the forests. You never do know in this game, but equally I knew I'd had a, a quite a good run and I hadn't wasted a lot of time in this stage. So, you know, Alistair went very well on the first stage this morning, but um, I'm pleased with my stage times after that. I think we were there or thereabouts on every stage after that uh, with, it, with the pressure. I mean, going into the last stage, it wasn't a nice feeling because I was in the same position 12 months ago and we had a big accident and uh, clearly that was just in the back of my mind and I certainly didn't want to do that in the Seat this year. So confirmation then, after a dramatic rally, Gwyndaf Evans taking that victory by 27 seconds from Tapio Laukinen with Martin Rowe making it two Renaults out of three. Alistair McRae, his fight back, taking him to four. Fifth place, Marco Ipati, the Group N winner ahead of Gavin Cox, the young Jana Tuhino, and Neil Weirden, the leader of the Ferodo Super 1600s. In the Drivers' Championship, Martin Rowe now leads Gwyndaf Evans by just a single point, with Neil Weirden holding on to third ahead of Tapio Laukinen. Alistair McRae in fifth feels he has to do everything in the latter half of the season, while the two ladies, Stephanie Simonite and Barbara Armstrong, are head-to-head, -head, 45 points each. In the Constructors' Championship, Seat lead Renault by four and a half points, with Ford and Vauxhall completing the top four. Handshakes all around in Carlisle, but the battle was well and truly on, as the teams prepared for their next duel across the border in Scotland. A short hop across the Solway Firth, north of the Scottish border, to forests, hills and glens which would provide two loops containing 13 of the most spectacular and scenic gravel special stages anywhere in Europe. Dumfries and Galloway was the host for the two-point scoring opportunities that would offer Martin Rowe the make or break of his Mobile One British Rally Championship bid. Quite good so far. We had a very good start on the Vauxhall Rally with a win. Not so bad overall on the Pirelli. And like you say, we've got a one-point lead here. We are in Scotland, so um, hopefully we'll continue with the championship leader sticker on the side of the car. Thanks to his FAA e seeding, the first on the road out of Dumfries is Yamakutaleto in the new Astra. I think for this event, it's uh, it's good, better than better than Pirelli. It was very rough in uh, Kilber Forest, but uh, this is. Uh, much better and three weeks ago we made the uh, three days test in Scot Scotland and we playing with uh, different things and, and, and I'm very confident from the car and, and I think it's maybe possible. Support already in evidence for Seat Gwyndaf Evans but he predicts a tough challenge ahead. Well, the pace will be very hot here in Scotland and um, clearly five or six drivers and teams are I'm eagerly trying to win this rally, so it should be a good, uh, good rally. Last year's winner, Alistair McRae, looks relaxed, but does being the home hero add to the pressure? No, I wouldn't say so. I think the, the main pressure comes from the championship now. We've had two not good results, so we've got to really try and win this and, and get the championship back in course. Good I think the only thing for me is to try and win both days. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but that's what we're here to try and do. If we do that, then hopefully the championship is back in our grasp. But on the opening stage in Twigley's Forest, it was another Finn setting the early pace. Renault team leader Tapio Laukonen was at his spectacular best, responding to the enthusiastic Scottish fans by covering the nine-mile, 14-kilometre stage in just eight minutes and 32 seconds. 
on the second stage, Craig, Lokanen's seemingly traditional bad luck struck again. Just as the Finn grabbed fifth gear, the Megan's power faded, and with it, any chance of rally victory. Now it was simply a case of trying to keep the car going to the end of the stage. We are in the middle of the stage. We have some fuel problems. Uh, we can probably manage to come out of the stage. There is some fuel pipe is broken in the engine. Gans engine was running again, but with over three minutes lost, Laukonen was now down to 30th place. His sole aim now would be to salvage championship points. Gwyndaf Evans had set the second fastest time on the opening stage, six seconds slower than Laukonen, but now the Welshman was in the rally lead. But it was still tight at the top. Evans had chosen a soft compound tyre for the second stage, and the recently regraded Craig Forest surface was more abrasive than he expected. The result was soaring tread temperatures and deteriorating handling by the end of the seven and a half miles. Evans still led, but only by two seconds from the determined Alistair McRae. McRae's strategy was not to cut too many corners and play it safe, reducing the risk of punctures. It seemed to be working. The golf was third fastest on the opening stage and fastest on stage two. Flat crest, it's a long flat left, tight to easy minus on crest. It's a right tightens to medium plus on crest. And flat left, and flat left into caution. Flat left into K left plus on crest, tightens down. Cut into long K right plus. 30. Flat right and left 50. Medium right. Martin Rowe was equal third with McRae on the opening stage, but then lost 10 seconds on stage two. The Manxman had chosen a different chassis setup to Laukonen's Megan, and it was giving him too much understeer. Right two, 40. Right three in, and left three, 40. Right four in, and right left three, 30. Right four in, and left five, cut. Yamakuta Leto's World Championship A seeding was working against him. Running as the first car through the stages, the Astra was acting as a snowplow, brushing all the loose stones clear for the cars behind. That almost certainly led to this puncture just before the end of stage one, which cost the Finn 20 seconds on the leaders, dropping him to fourth place. The 1998 Scottish Rally was already starting to take shape as the cars headed for two loops of three stages around the border town of Gala Shields. And Gwyndaf Evans' young supporter would be rewarded. The Welshman was driving brilliantly right on the limit. But Evans couldn't relax. McRae was matching him every inch of the way, and at the end of stage four, Alibank, McRae took the lead by a second. On stage five, Cardrona, the positions were reversed. Despite McRae throwing caution to the winds, Evans regained the lead, stretching a slender two-second margin. Martin Rowe was back on form after changing the Megan's differential at the Gala Shield service area, demonstrating the car's improved handling with the confirmation of his third place ahead of Yamaku Toledo. The Vauxhall team were on a steep learning curve on just the third event for the new car, and they were now learning about gearing on the super-fast Scottish stages as the Astra regularly hit the rev limiter in top gear. Fifth overall and in command of the Group N Production Cup class, Finland's Marko Ipati was enjoying a fast and trouble-free run in his Mitsubishi Charisma as many of his rivals suffered punctures and mechanical problems. 37 seconds behind the Finn, David Mann in the Proton had survived dropping into a ditch on the opening stage of the day, now he was ending the leg with a determined drive to sixth place and second in class. But there was disappointment for the initial production cup leader, David Higgins. 
The Subaru had originally run as high as fifth overall, but dropped down the leaderboard as it limped through the final stages jammed in third gear. Meanwhile, Neil Weirden was once again proving the giant killer in the little Honda Civic VTEC. Not only was the Lancastrian fireman leading the Ferodo Super 1600 Cup by over a minute, he was eighth overall, despite giving away 100 horsepower to the cars around him. And Weirden's 1600cc class lead was set to get even bigger. Justin Dale in the Peugeot 106 Maxi was the main challenger for most of day one, but the Peugeot's engine was losing power and rattling badly. It was soon a case of surviving to the end of the day. The Proton Super 1600 team have had a tough start to this season, with every rally so far ending with engine failure. This time the Swede, Matt Anderson, survived the first stage of the day with the engine intact, only to slide off the road and into retirement on stage two. But sadly for Jenny Davies in the second Proton, the form book ran true. On just the first stage of the event, the car was again in trouble. That's oil smoke mingling with the Scottish dust. In the Ladies' Cup battle, Barbara Armstrong in the Seat ended the opening stage 15 seconds ahead of her rivals, the Simonites. But her advantage was only a brief one. On stage two, the Seat went off the road and lost the lead. On stage three, she went off the road again, this time out of the event. Perhaps then had been plain sailing for Stephanie and Rachel Simonite in the escort, but of course in rallying you should never ever make predictions. This was the scene on stage four, Elibank, with the Simonites limping in 52nd place after damaging the steering, hitting a rock. At least for the Simonites they would be able to continue after limping to the service area. We've um, had a bit of an accident, well not an accident, we just hit a rock that was in the road that I just couldn't avoid, it was on, on Elibank and uh, it was like more like a boulder than a rock and it was just hit it with the inside left wheel and it just shattered the wheel in half which then got wedged underneath so we couldn't come out on three wheels so we had to stop jack it up and change the wheel get the spare out put that on and then the tire was stuck underneath so it took us ages to get it out and uh, we bent the steering arm there look so it's like a banana <laughs> no brakes um, so we came out on the handbrake which was the uh, Quite exciting, and we were both on the handbrake at one point, tucking on to try and stop the damn thing. And then uh, it passed, it rammed us up the back as well because he couldn't see us for the dust. So that was another shock. So my neck will be a bit sore tomorrow, but we're here and it's quite exciting because nothing never usually goes wrong. So it's quite exciting. Well, we sat there at the beginning of the stage and we decided we'd, we'd go for it, and we were well committed, and uh, suddenly there was this like strange sensation like the engine wasn't pulling much. So uh, we managed to try and keep it going for as long as we could, hoping we'd struggle to the end of the stage. Um, but unfortunately, it didn't manage it. <laughs> so we had to pull over and stop. I just went wide on quite a narrow corner and um, didn't think anything of it. Just kept my foot in. And as I came to the exit of the corner, there happened to be a log pile, which is about five feet high, and we just packed ourselves on top of it. We can't get off it. The view from Tapio Laukonen's Renault, fighting back to 15th place, shows just how neatly Armstrong parked the Seat on the left of the track. Laukonen had been close to rejoining the top 10, but then more bad luck. A double puncture made this a day for the Finn to forget. It went very well after that, but now on the last stage, Eli Bank second down. We got the two punctures there and we lost a few minutes again, so we are behind everybody again, but uh, still we have to just finish this day and uh, start it again in the morning. Lokanen wasn't the only one. As the drivers compared notes before the eighth and final stage of the day, David Higgins found it hard to hide his frustration. Unfortunately again, um, it seems to be a bit of a problem we have with the gearbox seems to be letting us down. Like the guys have worked so hard, produced a fantastic car and it handles fantastic and we had the lead again and prepared and then the same old problem that's been dogging us for the last two years, which is the only thing that is totally out of our control as a team. It's a bit of a shame when you, you drive and you haven't put so much work into it and the same old problem um, reoccurs itself. And it's not just straight back again and finishes it all off. We, we were back on seconds all, all day to lose two minutes. So it's, the fight's not really going to be there anymore, unfortunately, for today. So we'll have to see what we can do tomorrow now. About two, three stages ago, the uh, engine started rattling and you think it's actually dropped a valve 
the valve spring broke, something like that. But then um, coming in here now, it's actually gone down on three cylinders as well. So we've done the last uh, three stages with the valve gone. Um, so we've been sort of looking at the oil pressure and things like that. But looking at the time, we just had a look. Actually, we went, didn't lose much time at all. So uh, if we can get it going again in service now, we can do the last stage and get some points for today. The rattling engine said it all about the battle nearly to finish day one of the 1998 Scottish Rally, and there was the same again still to come. So the leaderboard after eight stages confirmed Gwyndaf Evans as the overnight leader and winner of maximum Mobile One British Rally Championship points. Marco Epati heads the Production Cup winners in fifth overall and Neil Weirden in eighth. Gwyndaf Evans moves into the lead of the Drivers' Championship ahead of Roe, Weirden and McRae with the two ladies' championship rivals Barbara Armstrong and Stephanie Simonite in a dead heat. Seat now lead the Manufacturers' Championship by 11.5 points from Renault, with Vauxhall and Volkswagen now closing in fast on Ford's third place. And with a second opportunity to score points on day two, as well as claiming overall rally honours, there was still everything to play for. Brilliant day for Seat again. Like, I think the, the cars performed very well, and um, yeah, there's been a big fight between myself and Alistair all day, and um, clearly today I'm, I've come on top. He's got today with two seconds, but you know, there's still tomorrow. But good bank of points anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's second point, so we just need to make sure we get the first lot of points tomorrow. We have to go for it tomorrow. Um, we've had a third place today, so obviously Gwyndaf's our main rival for the championship, and he's come away with 32 points, so we'll have to try and set the pace tomorrow. A wet start to the second day of the Scottish Rally with the five remaining stages taking the drivers northwest from Dumfries in a loop through the hills around Newton Stewart. There were now effectively two rallies in one. McRae and Evans fighting for the overall Scottish Rally result based on aggregate times and Rowe 32 seconds behind in third and Laukonen fighting for day two honours and maximum points. And right from the word go, Martin Rowe was in determined mood, storming through the opening 16-mile clattering shore stage in a spectacular 14 minutes and 7 seconds. It was the same story for his teammates, Tapio Laukonen and Tapio Jervi. Second fastest, and they have their own special way of calling the corners. Even clipping a rock and causing this horrendous noise from a brake disc didn't stop Laukonen from setting the fastest time on Blacklock, the second stage of the day, with Rowe taking the advantage back again on the next stage, Glen Trull. As far as day two honours were concerned, it was a Renault 1-2, but this wasn't the true battle for the rally lead. 20 seconds ahead on the leaderboard, the battle was on in earnest between McRae and Evans. It was first blood to the Welshman, the Seat gaining a precious second over the Gulf on the opening stage of the day. His lead was now three seconds. But Evans was still a worried man, not sure of the car's engine, concerned that the misfire first noticed last night might be getting worse. But McRae was to have a bigger problem on the next stage, Black Lock. A punctured rear tyre would cost him 12 seconds, putting him 15 seconds behind Evans. Flat right into flat left, 50, care. 
flat right tightens to slow, easy plus, 50, left tightens to long medium, on press, into, flat right, 30, now, easy left minus, tightens over bridge, 30, bridge and medium right plus, open. The end of the long Glen Trill special stage, McRae was now equal second with the flying Martin Rowe. But if there was one driver enjoying the weather, it was Yamaku Toledo. The wet conditions were disguising the Astra's low gearing. And in any case, these forests are almost identical to those back home. The result for the Finn was fourth place, less than two minutes behind the top three. David Mann was flying high in the Proton, the mushroom farmer from Suffolk heading for seventh overall and second place in the production cup. It was a good result, but there was no catching the class leader now over a minute ahead. Marco Ipati, like Kutaleto, was revelling in the forest stages so similar to his native Thousand Lakes. His Mitsubishi charisma would end the day fifth overall, one minute and ten seconds ahead of David Mann. Despite collecting two punctures, Neil Weirden would end the day eleventh overall in the Honda Civic VTEC. But more importantly, his fifth successive victory in the Ferodo Super 1600 class would give him sufficient points to hold on to third place in the Drivers' Championship. Despite crashing out on the opening leg of the rally, the new rules meant that Mats Anderson was able to restart day two to chase Ferodo's Super 1600 points. A reliable run through the day stages was a major boost for Harry Hockley and the team. Barbara Armstrong's bad luck was set to continue, however. A puncture on the first stage of the day and failed windscreen wipers on the second meant that she wouldn't be able to overhaul her season-long rivals, the Simonites. The Yorkshire lasses were having a much better second day of the rally, working their way back up the leaderboard to 21st place overall. But in the final service area, even an unusual problem wasn't going to stop Martin Rowe from smiling. He was now challenging for second place. I don't know what happened. We, we lost the aerial, so maybe the aerial flipped back and smashed the wind window. So, air conditioning in a rally car. <laughs> But there were more serious worries for rally leader Gwyndaf Evans. That misfire was getting worse. We've had some niggly problems coming back with the, with the engine misfire, which is difficult to put a time factor to it, but it is costing us some time on the stages. And um, clearly the engineers are working flat out at trying to rectify that. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. You just feel it just hesitating like this sometimes, you know, coming out of some corner sometimes. So clearly it's costing fractions of seconds, but you know, as you know, it's only fractions of seconds that separate us all. Any key incidents where afterwards you've been thinking, whoa, that was a close one? Oh yeah, I got a few of those. <laughs> I'm told I'm not trying if we don't have some of them. <laughs> 15 seconds behind, would Alistair McRae now settle for second place? If we hadn't dropped the, the 15 seconds or so this morning with the puncture then, it might have been one second between us and Gwendaf, so we'll just go as fast as we can and see what happens at the end. You can't think about what the other man is doing, but 15 seconds then to, to Gwendaf, is that uh, surmountable over 18 miles, do you think? No, if we, if we both have a clean run then, uh, we've been very close, it's just been seconds between us at the end of stages, so to do that, take 15 seconds out is not possible unless there's a problem. As long as we keep second, uh, Martin's been going very quickly today in some of the stages, so, I don't know, try and keep second, or if Gwyndaf has a problem, maybe first. In classic Scottish rally tradition, it was down to the final stage, 18 miles to I Forest. Yama Kutaleto was satisfied to bring the Astra home in fourth place. On just its third ever championship event, every stage mile is teaching the team something new and bringing the Astra ever closer to the opposition. But the Finns' time of 19 minutes and a second would be almost a minute slower than the flying Martin Rowe. Just a second behind McRae at the start of the stage, he was determined to try for that second place. Four feet. Right three and left three. Seven feet. Left five over crest. Thirteen. Right three. Crest. 40. Rowe's time of 18 minutes and 6 seconds was the target for McRae to beat, not only to hold on to his second place, but maybe to challenge Evans for the lead. McRae was giving it everything. Watch out for the easy left minus on crest. Into flat right. 50. 
was a wheel in the ditch in fifth gear at well over 100 miles an hour. His time was identical to Rowe, 18 minutes and 6 seconds. McRae's luck had held, but what about Evans? The Welshman's stage started well, but by half distance he was in trouble. In addition to the misfire, the washer bottle had exploded inside the car, spraying fluid onto the pedals and forcing the screen to mist up. McRae's dream was coming true. From 15 seconds behind at the start of the stage, he was now the rally winner by just a second from Martin Rowe. So, a home win for McRae for the second successive year by the smallest margin possible, with a bitterly disappointed Evans making it three cars covered by just 30 seconds after 133 miles of special stages. Marco Ipati claimed fifth and production cup victory ahead of the recovering Tapio Laukonen, and that means that Martin Rowe moves back to the head of the Drivers' Championship by four points from Gwyneth Evans, with Neil Weirden and Alistair McRae third and fourth. Lauken and Kutaleto claim fifth and sixth, while Stephanie Simonite's now a single point ahead of Barbara Armstrong. Seat still lead the Manufacturers' Championship from Renault, while the battle for third continues between Volkswagen, Ford and Vauxhall. So, a home win for a delighted Alistair McRae. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I mean, we've been, we've been fighting second for second all rally, then we had the problem this morning with the puncture. The drops were the 15 seconds, if it wasn't for that, then I'm sure there would have been three of us going to split by one or two seconds, so it doesn't matter how you do it, if you do it, it feels good. You know, obviously at the moment we just finished the rally and I'm very disappointed that we didn't get more, but um, hopefully tomorrow morning we'll reflect on it and you know, we're very much alive and very, very much in the running for the championship. I think we're four points ahead of Gwyndaf now going into Ulster, which is excellent, and now Renault have overtaken Seat for the manufacturers, so we're really pleased. It would have been nice to, you know, win the rally overall, but one second after two days is very, very close. So, you know, we're, we're very happy with the days, or two days results. We got the photo days, the results, and it's of course very important, but uh, I like to win, but it's not, not possible this time, and maybe, hopefully, in future. In future. And another Ferodo Super 1600 win for Neil Weirden marks him as the man to watch for the future. Well, won both uh, 1600cc, the Ferodo 1600 Cup, on both days. Um, and I think we're still third in the Mobile One standings. Me and Trevor, the, the co-driver, we worked out we're at the top of the Division One, um, the Premier Leagues, Martin Rowe, Gwyneth Evans, etc. I think I'm uh, best of the rest in Division One. So hopefully I'll get promoted to the Prem Premier League next year. <laughs> Team managers take note, but it's Scotland the brave for Alistair McRae and David Senior, winners of the 1998 Scottish Rally. <laughs> But now the character of the Mobile One British Rally Championship would change completely as the teams headed across the Irish Sea for the Stena Lines Ulster Rally. Gone was the loose gravel in the forests. Here it was all tarmac, country roads closed to the public for Ulster's biggest motorsport festival. in Belfast, the pressure was on for Martin Rowe. It's going to be pretty much flat from the start. Our main rival here is, is Gwyndaf, obviously, so I've got to do everything necessary to get ahead of Gwyndaf and stay ahead of him. The Renault is quite a wide car, which is an advantage on the wider roads. It's more stable, but on the narrow roads here in Ulster, um, there's literally no room for error, and the side of the doors are against the grass and the hedges. No room for error, too, for Alistair McRae. Usually the, the first day of the Ulster, uh, the stages are good and clean. This year in the record, there's been an awful lot of rain, uh, and there's all the farmers are working, so there's a lot of mud on the road. So I think it's going to be fairly difficult, especially if it's dry one minute, then wet the next. I think it'd be nice to be here with the, the new Mark IV car, uh, but at the moment it's not. We've not done enough testing uh, to use it. It's a bit of a risk, so we know the old car. It's maybe not the quickest on the asphalt, but it's reliable, so if we can get a, a good result here, somebody else's problems, then you never know, we can maybe get a win. Welsh wizard Gwyndaf Evans was in no mood for predictions. 
I don't think there'll be a lot of tactics on this rally, so no. I think it won't finish until the last stage on this this event, and it's, it's more so than normal because all, you know, there's so much chal challenging stages, even tomorrow on Saturday, and that's let alone today, today, like, so I think this rally won't be, you know, won until it's absolutely over, like. As Rose Renner McGann headed the field to the first of eight stages making up the opening day of the event, the stakes were to get still higher as torrential rainstorms made driving conditions even harder. The rainstorms had hit between the recce by the team's tyre crews and the arrival of the competitors, so Rowe had to gamble on tyre choice. And to make matters worse, a broken intercom connection meant that for part of the stage he had to do without co-driver Derek Ringer's pace notes. Even so, Rowe's time for the opening five and a half mile Cargi Grey stage was five minutes and ten seconds, an average of over 70 miles an hour. Next through, McRae wasn't too happy with the conditions, but the Golf was faster than the Renault by a single second. Windaf Evans' time for the stage was the same as Rowe's, but it wasn't as even as it seemed. Middle of a bad jump and three left to the Yumpy Crest here. Keep left a slot nine right. The spin lost Evans almost 20 seconds, so there was no doubting that Seat's potential pace. 250 over two crests and dip. 250 over two crests and dip. Care, okay, three right sharp, or oh, bad jump, care. 30, slot nine right. And look out for the warning tape that's now flapping from the Ibiza's rear spoiler. It's still got the fencing post attached. Tapio Laukinen was the fastest of the championship contenders with a time of five minutes and seven seconds. But the Renault's engine note showed how difficult it was to find traction. His fellow Finn, Yamakuta Leto, was going well in the Astra, with another 5 minutes and 10 seconds time matching Evans and Rowe. Despite the conditions, it was turning into a classic Ulster rally. On the limit from the word go. Yet the regulars were being outpaced by a local hero. Until gearbox problems intervened, Kenny McKinstry in a pre-kit car Ford RS2000 was the leading Formula 2 driver, a second ahead of Laukonen. By the second special stage, the battle for the Ladies' Cup was in full flight. Barbara Armstrong Seat was heading a three-car battle. But Jenny Davies in the Proton wasn't set to go much further. Watch the fence on the outside as she tackles the right-hander on Hamilton's Folly. The stage was stopped as the scale of the accident became apparent. Luckily, both Jenny and co-driver Claire Mole escaped unhurt. That left Stephanie and Rachel Simonite in pursuit of Armstrong, but it wasn't proving an easy task. There's a lot of standing water everywhere. We've got a new car, a new suspension, and it's a bit hard at the moment. It's not dealing with the smaller bumps very well, although it's a lot better over the big bumps. So it's just as well, because we didn't have them all noted as well. <laughs> and we've been off oh, been already. Off already. Yeah, luckily the gate was off the hinges, so we were able to go straight through <laughs> and into the field and a bit of grass tracking and then back, back on out. the road again. So it's not going too well at the moment. The sun came out for special stage three, but the wet conditions had allowed David Mann's four-wheel drive Group N Proton Weera to start the stage in the overall rally lead. The advantage of the four-wheel drive cars would evaporate with the rainwater, but not before Jeremy Eason, giving his brand new Mitsubishi Lancer Evo 5 its rally debut, had matched the early stage time set by Evans, Rowe and Kutaleto. Joint leader after the opening stages, Johnny Milner was giving his new Group N Toyota its debut. Just outside the top ten, Justin Dale in the Peugeot 106 Maxi was leading a fierce battle at the head of the Ferodo Super 1600cc class. The car, which had struggled on the earlier gravel events, was now in its element on the Ulster tarmac. But title leader Neil Weirden wasn't giving up. The Honda Civic was just a handful of seconds behind the Peugeot. Matt Anderson in the sole remaining Proton, though, had a problem. Its blowing exhaust was a sign of a broken engine mount.
adding to the Super 1600 variety, Julian Reynolds was giving the SW Motorsport Citroen Saxo its British Championship debut. But the car wasn't set to make it to the end of the day. On the fourth stage, we got about a mile, a half to a mile into the stage, and on a tight 90 right, we just came around the corner and the front wheel overtook us. Um, we're bouncing down the road, so all the studs are cheered. So, like you say, we're spectating now for the rest of the event. It's a shame because the, the car, we were really slow on the first stage, just took our time in the wet, and then we had the wrong tyres for the first dry stage, but we had a really good time in there. The car started getting used to the car, and uh, we were hoping to sort of reel the others in. That was the plan, but uh, unfortunately, things don't work out always with rallying. The Simonites weren't set to finish the day either. Fortunately, escaping unhurt from an accident which forced Special Stage 4 to be stopped, with their wrecked car blocking the road. But that hadn't happened in time to save Yama Kutaleto from disappointment. Listen to the Astra's engine note on Stage 4. <laughs> Oscar one to service, Oscar one to service. Let me say something. Go ahead, Oscar one. Uh, head up rally. Engine is gone. Are you out of the stage or are you stuck on the stage, over? We are just arriving at the Queen East line. Can you possibly get to service, Arto, over? No. That do you no understand? chance. The diagnosis, a broken cam belt and all 16 valves buried in the pistons. Well, early bounce. Right. Yeah, flat left, 200. The drier conditions were now allowing the two litre cars to pull clear at the head of the field. Evans now led, but only by six seconds, and it wasn't easy going in the Seat. No pace notes can advise on gravel washed onto the road by rain, and the 10 seconds lost here gave the pursuing Renaults another chance to challenge. Martin Rowe was holding on to second place, but wasn't happy with his driving in the conditions. The damp patches on the tarmac were stopping him from building a rhythm with the car, and the Manxman was finding it difficult to stay at the limit. Malkinen in the second Renault was potentially the faster of the two, but his cause wasn't helped by redesigning the Megane's rear suspension on a bank on stage three. Despite this, the crab track Renault was still third, just six seconds behind Rowe. Alistair McRae, fourth, was visibly on the limit in the Golf, but despite the Scots' efforts, he was now 20 seconds behind Evans and losing more ground as the conditions improved. Austrian champion Ramon Baumschlager in the second factory golf was now up to fifth place. It was a superb performance given that he'd never driven in Ulster before, but he was realistic about any chances of victory. Okay, maybe we can catch somebody, but uh, I think these two Reynolds and the Seat is very, very fast. And they are in front of Alistair, so it is not so easy to catch points from them. <laughs> Obviously, driving as quickly as I can, uh, there's no more left, and we're catching and uh, marking a bit. The wind after the staying the same, and then Tapu's blown away, so I've just got to keep on trying and hope that they have a problem or, or maybe the weather changes. As the cars arrived in Newry service area in County Down with four more stages of the leg to go, the battle lines were drawn Dale versus Weirden in Super 1600s, Lokanen versus Evans for the rally itself. Or did Seat have a problem? Partly my fault and partly it's the, the car fault. We've been having a long brake pedal towards the end of the stages and that was about two miles from the end. And as I came to the hairpin, I was carrying a bit too much speed into it. It just touched on the handbrake and she spun on the little gravel. And of course it locked then against the, as you saw probably on, on the television. Um, unfortunately, the reverse is very difficult on, on that car. I've got to select neutral first and use a little lever down downside. So, and I had to do that twice, as you saw probably. Um, so, more frustrating than anything else. But um, we're here now and I think they've found what the problem is with the brake. So we should be okay now.
this next stage is very nasty. <laughs> uh, stage five, that was a particular um, dirty one. A lot of um, farmers, but more, more so a lot, a lot of milking and a lot of cows. So um, clearly, um, you know, their deposits aren't very grippy. As it turned out, the cows weren't the problem for Evans. On the limit at over 100 miles an hour, he came terrifyingly close to a multiple roll. This time, thanks to loose chippings. Slot nine right on press, chippings. 30. Flat right, 100. Three left through dip, 100. Left through dip, 100. Slot nine right, chipping sharp. Oh my well held, boy. That way. That way we're going. Go on, go on. Okay, enough. Thirty. Three right. And square right. A big scare, right. another recovery, and more lost time. But Evans' luck had held with a handily placed junction. Less lucky was local driver Philip Young and his escort, who had a close encounter with some masonry. One left over crest, and one left 40, 75 right, and two long five left, don't cut, whoa, whoa. Keep going, 40, it's all right, yep. five right over crest, 40. Oh, whoa, whoa, what's wrong? Wheels, wheels underneath our pole. Which one? This one here. Front or back? This front one here. Okay. Keep four right and the cut five left, 40. Marco Epati knew that a top three position in Group N could clinch him a production cup title in Ulster. His cautious start was paying off. The Finn was now 10th overall and 4th in class, 36 seconds behind Jeremy Eason's newer Evo 5 Mitsubishi. Both Eason and David Higgins in the Subaru were now closing in on class leader David Mann in the Proton. Tarmac rallies like this are a way of life south of the border in era, so it's familiar territory for Liam McCallaghan, sixth overall in the Escort. Raymond Baumschlager was fifth in his goal, battling to match pace of teammate Alistair McRae fourth. Martin Rowe was heading back to Belfast third, but the Renault team weren't happy. Lauchlan had taken the lead on stages five and six, but Gwyndaf Evans regained the overnight lead by a 14-second margin. Well, I've um, been in reverse gear five times so far in this rally, and uh, that's not normal, and it's very time-consuming. Apart from that, the team and the cars worked well, and we're very pleased with the debut on an international rally on asphalt in the Evolution 2 car. It's been a very good day. So many different happenings all the time. Now on the last stage, uh, I missed one junction, so uh, we lost 15, 15 seconds. We have to reverse and come back to the right road and then go for him. Anyway, still looking good for it tomorrow. Disappointed to be honest with uh, I haven't really got into a rhythm with my notes and with my driving. The, the, re the last stages have been better because they've been dry, but early on the conditions have been very inconsistent. It's difficult to know where to push and where not. Just 28 seconds separates the top four after eight stages. Evans leads by 14 of those ahead of Laukonen, Rowe and McRae. Baumschlager's fifth ahead of O'Callaghan and the Group N battlers, Mann and Higgins. The drama even continued on the road back to Belfast when a fuel line exploded on Mats Anderson's Super 1600 Proton. The car was a total meltdown. Day two and 11 more stages for Gwyndaf Evans to worry about the cattle. Damp tarmac too would make conditions difficult to predict, but this time it wasn't Evans finding the trouble spots. The Welshman was starting with caution, taking nine minutes, 19 seconds to cover the 8.6 mile Drummond stage. Behind him, the pressure was on the Renault team to challenge. Rowe proved a second faster. Laukonen may have gone faster still, but debris along the side of his car showed that the Finn had just survived a 100 mile an hour, sixth gear spin, costing him over 30 seconds. It was left to Alistair McRae to set the fastest time of the stage, 9 minutes 15 seconds, but all the driver's efforts were in vain, when the stage was abandoned after being blocked by a huge accident. A 
direct wall and a wrecked Mitsubishi. Jeremy Eason's car was brand new at the start of this event. It had done less than a thousand miles before being completely destroyed. More Group N Blues as class leader David Mann dropped back with gearbox troubles. Plus more obvious signs of the frantic pace. That meant that Robert Woodside moved up to ninth overall, second in class and top Ulsterman. And Marco Ipati was now seventh, class leader, and on his way to the Production Cup title. It was fast and furious for the Peugeots. Justin Dale was class leader and eighth overall in his Peugeot 106 Maxi. And the spectacular Adam Kent in his 306 S16 was moving up the field to 13th overall and third in class. In the Ford camp, Liam McCallaghan's escort was upholding Southern Irish honours with a fine sixth overall. And his teammate, Lars Jöran Andersson from Sweden, was now up to 11th place. But things were still going badly for Philip Young. He was dropping down the order, with first a front puncture, then much worse. Square right, gravel, into right 40. Five left over gravel 80. Left over crest on two right, maybe over crest. 60, right, 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 after his disappointing run on day one, Martin Rowe was keeping his cool and keeping the pressure on Evans from second place. Wokenham was less happy. After his spin on the opening stage, a string of problems dropped him to fourth behind McRae. Then this puncture on stage 13 would drop the fin down to seventh place. It was just a puncture. There was uh, some kind of sharp stone or something in, uh, into the curve. It wasn't so bad noise or nothing, but you can feel it, it touched somewhere. So. Then, uh, Six miles for the flat tires, we lost uh, two and a half or three minutes guess. After our main rivals crashed out in day one, Barbara Armstrong had the luxury of being able to cruise to victory in the Ladies' Cup, making the Ulster Rally a clean sweep, so far at least, for Sayat. At the head of the field, Gwyndaf Evans would have a full minute in hand when he arrived at the Tobermore services with the final three stages to go. But you couldn't ever call this cruising. Late three right long, 30, slot six left, hidden, slot six left, hidden, and three left for crash, 30. It's so narrow, you've just got to like, let everybody else make some mistakes. There's some cracking holes and hedges and walls down out there. <laughs> Not such good news for us. Um, Gwyndaf just took two seconds a mile off us on the last stage. He took 22 seconds, which I'm not happy about. Um, I mean, I've, the car felt quite good. It was slippery in places, but, you know, it doesn't add up, so we'll just have to go faster. Even though it seems quite dry at the moment, it's real greasy and the, the mud's actually sort of taken away from the corner, up to straight out of the corner, and you just can't get the power down. It's looking very close between me and Justin now. Um, I don't know whether to get drawn into the battle with him for the overall honours on the rally, or to just settle for the championship. Um, it's probably veering towards the uh, championship at the moment. Um, we'll see how they... I don't actually know his time from the last couple of stages. We'll find out what they are and then decide after that. Probably go towards the championship because at the end of the day, that's a sensible choice. Weird and sensible choice would indeed take him to 10th overall, second in class and claim the 1998 Perodo Super 1600 Championship crown for the Asquith Autosport on the Civic. Barbara Armstrong's 19th overall gave her maximum points in the ladies' championship, which means that her battle with Stephanie Simonite will go to the final round in the Isle of Man. Now McShay didn't win his 1300 class in the Micra, but he thrilled his home fans with his sideways motoring. Ahead of him, the top Ulsterman was Robert Woodside, who claimed 9th overall and 2nd in Group N, 
co-driven by Alan Harriman, son of former world champion Terry. The Peugeot team's efforts paid off with victory in the Ferodo Super 1600s for Justin Dale and the 106 Maxi, eighth overall. And in seventh, Marco Ipati claimed the 1998 Group N Production Cup title. But in sixth place, Tapio Laukonen would reflect on a rally to forget. He even suffered the embarrassment of sliding off as he allowed Roman Baumschlager to overtake. The Austrian would head for fourth, ahead of the escort of Liam O'Callaghan. But the rally wasn't over yet as far as Alistair McRae was concerned. A fight back meant that he started the final three stages just ten seconds behind Martin Rowe. Rowe was obviously right on the limit and sometimes beyond it. And to make matters worse, there was a problem with Derek Ringer's normally infallible pace notes. Rowe held on for second place, but while Evans was in a class of his own, the pressure inside the Seat on the final stage showed he was still taking nothing Six for right, granted. Keep 150, keep right for four left of a yumpy crest. Four left of a yumpy crest. 120, caution, middle of a bad yumpy crest, into three left. Middle of a bad yumpy crest, into three left. 100, flat left, 70, yes! three left and right. Yes! Spot on! This will be a rally Gwyndaf Evans and Howard Davies will remember for a long, long time. The 1998 Stenaline Ulster Rally, one of the hardest fought victories. So confirmation then of Gwyndaf Evans' victory by 54 seconds ahead of Rowe, McRae and Baumschlager. Leo McCallaghan takes fifth place with Tapio Lauken in sixth, Marco Ipati, the Group N winner, in seventh place, ahead of Justin Dale, the Ferodo Super 1600 winner. And that means that Martin Rowe and Gwyndaf Evans go into the final round of the British Rally Championship head-to-head -head on the championship points. And Barbara Armstrong and Stephanie Simonite have only six points between them, also going into the final round. Only Seat or Renault can win the Manufacturers' Championship now. Eight and a half points separates them, with Volkswagen third, Ford a fourth, Vauxhall a fifth, Peugeot sixth and Proton seventh, heading for the Isle of Man. The Manx might favour Martin a bit because the car is very good there, but um, we'll fight to the end and I think it'll make a, a good climax to the season. Guys, I'm a little disappointed because we didn't beat the Seat, but uh, as you say, it's going to be exciting on the Manx with equal pegging going into that rally. And uh, well, whoever's first home wins the championship. Do you think you go to Manx a slight favourite? It's a difficult question to ask me, actually, isn't it? Uh, I would say, OK, you can have the Renault as the favourite, but I hope we're the Dark Horse and I hope the Dark Horse wins. They're all hard, to be honest. I mean, you know, these guys don't let us have a free, uh, free win. Like, I mean, you've got to work to get a, an international win in the British Championship these days. One final ferry crossing for the crews, this time to the Isle of Man, the Manx Rally, Britain's fastest event, will provide a classic finale for both championship titles. Appropriately three legs, a total of 24 stages would decide whether Gwyndaf Evans or Martin Rowe, Seat or Renault will be the champions. If I would have written the book out, I don't think I'd have written it this way, but um, it's good for the championship at least, isn't it? And uh, hopefully it'll be very good for the spectators out there. Um, and as you say, 
first man to the post wins. That's it, sums it up. <laughs> I mean, we're both going to be flat out from the way it goes. Um, you know, the pressure's on both of us. That's it, it's simple, isn't it? The pressure's on you, but I mean, do you actually adopt any sort of tactics for this, or is it a case of just flat out? It's got to be. I mean, if, if each driver can't allow the other driver to get ahead because there's not many opportunities to pull back time. Um, we're both going to be pushing very hard, as, as is the top five, I'm sure. A wet start for the five evening stages making up leg one, and Martin Rowe had the job of setting the pace round the streets of the island's capital, Douglas. This is home territory for Rowe, a Manxman born and bred. Rowe topped the timesheets on these opening stages, but there's no relaxing when Welshman Gwyndaf Evans is in hot pursuit. Despite struggling with handling problems, Evans was fastest on the last stage of the day, but he was still in second place, 16 seconds behind Rowe. Six left long, six left long. 118. Three right long continues, keep in. Another Manx native was making a return. 1997 champion Mark Higgins running in third place through the classic Castletown Harbour stage. He was giving the Nissan Almera its British Championship debut on a rare break from Nissan's World Rally Championship programme. Alistair McRae had opted to end the season in the old faithful Mark III Golf rather than the untried new model. Turn, K left plus narrows and tight hairpin right. And K left plus wide. But McRae's Golf was set to lose its reputation for reliability on stage five when a plug fell out of the engine management unit. The delay cost McRae nearly 12 minutes, turning his bid for the lead into a battle to get back into the top 20 from the tail of the field. The unlucky Proton team, who've suffered engine problems on every rally this season, now had something new. This time, Matt Anderson was lost within a mile of the rally start, eventually finding a back entrance to the opening stage. The Swede, though, was quick to make amends, surprising many of the established Super 1600 runners with the revitalised Proton's pace. A short, sharp opening leg, but already the rally was taking its toll, with McRae in trouble, while Rowe headed Evans for the lead, and in sixth place, David Mann headed eighth place David Higgins in the Production Cup class. Day two, and a change in the weather. Bright and clear, with a strong wind blowing the tarmac dry after each passing shower. Perfect conditions for the two loops of six stages, which made up the day's action. No change, though, at the head of the field. Martin Rowe extended his lead by a further 13 seconds on the two opening stages, pushing hard to open a 29-second cushion over Evans. It was a sound strategy because on the third stage, he needed every second he could get. No problems at first, flat out in sixth gear at 120 miles an hour, but it all changed at the chicane. 100. Crest, 50, left, 15, 50. Crest down right to 150. Ah, oh, no, man. Drive that. Okay, okay. Right 3 plus 150. Left 3, 100. Okay, calm down. Ringer's job was now to keep the frustrated Rowe calm. The pair would limp to service, wondering whether this was the chance Evans had been waiting for. Evans was on the limit, but he was struggling too. The Seat suspension setup wasn't riding the bumps well, and even the Welsh wizard could only reduce Rowe's lead to 16 seconds. champion Mark Higgins wasn't able to take advantage either. The Nissan Almera kit car was suffering from an intermittent misfire which made the power delivery unpredictable. A 
As a result, his third place was now coming under pressure from the determined Tapia Laukonen in the second of the two Renaults. The Finn had lost ground with a bad tyre choice on the previous night in the rain, but he was now the fastest driver on the island, setting the fastest time on four out of the six morning stages. Behind him, Robbie Head started the day in fifth place in his Seat, but the Scots' successful return to the British Championship wasn't going to last much longer. Watch the left front wheel. Quick thinking to stop the car without more damage, but as the full extent of the problem became clear, the the wheel off our driver? or was it? All four wheel studs had sheared, making fitting the spare wheel impossible. The only chance for Head now was to finish the stage on three wheels. I thought you had your barber, Ray, and if you've got your gun, love, I'll get your friend, yeah, but look, love, don't worry. <laughs> 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 I'm heavy enough, I lost all this weight, buddy. Get the wheel on the roof, buddy. Oh, 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 oh. Time was ticking oh, by as the Super 1600 front runners went through, in, but the decision had been made so narrow, if Head could uh, limp to the end of the stage, he should be able to stay in the rally. What else are you going to do? Otherwise, you're out anyway. In the tailgate, co-driver Brian Thomas was now regretting going on his diet as he was being used as ballast to try to keep the front end from digging into the tarmac. But the gouge left by the brake disc showed that there was only an outside chance of getting to the finish. Well, uh, you obviously saw what happened. The wheel studs just sheared completely off and that, that really caused us to lose the wheel. We had no option uh, but to try and drive it maybe to service. So we got about five miles into that stage and uh, then it was causing too much damage to the car and we dropped so much time by that point that it wasn't worthwhile continuing so we, we had it on the head there and just pulled over and went out the rally unfortunately. In the Seat camp there was frantic work on Evan's car too. The team was trying every permutation of suspension setup to give the Welshman the best chance to fight Roe for the lead and the title. Martin's going very, very well, and uh, obviously the car suits the train very well as well, and uh, he's making the most of the power advantage he's got. There's a lighter mood in the Renault camp, but it's still deadly serious for Rowe. Well, we've had a patch of trouble. I um, can't remember the number of the stage. Uh, we had a, a drive shaft pull out, and we only had one wheel drive for four miles, so we dropped 10 seconds to Gwinda. It's a bit of a panic in the car, because if we, if we hadn't sorted it out, we would have had to go through the Kuruk stage after that, and we would have lost a lot more time. So. Um, the drive shaft literally popped out of the gearbox and then on the road section um, it went back in okay for the next stage so we were really lucky. Robbie Head's retirement promoted the Finn Yamakutaleto to fifth place in the Vauxhall Astra. <laughs> But he too was set to suffer a similar problem to the rally leader. Coming out of the right-hander, a drive shaft failed and the Astra was forced to limp to the finish with one wheel drive. The Finn set the hazard warning lights to one of his reduced pace. Although he wouldn't lose his fifth position, he would drop two minutes behind the fourth placed Higgins. Behind Kutaleto, there was a fantastic three-cornered fight for sixth, seventh and eighth, with just 20 seconds covering the three cars. Irishman Liam O'Callaghan in his escort kit car was eighth, and closing in fast on the production cup proton of David Mann, who no longer had the overnight advantage of four-wheel drive on wet tarmac. But the Suffolk farmer was still in hot pursuit of production cup leader, David Higgins in the Subaru Impreza WRX. Another Max Bond driver, he was using all his local knowledge to hold on to sixth place overall by a 10 second margin. There was disappointment though for former production class world champion Gregoire de Mervius. The Belgian had matched Higgins for the first few stages, but he was now limping and set to retire his pro drive prepared in Prenta at the end of the stage. In the Ladies' Cup, Barbara Armstrong, 10th overall, was leading the Simonite sisters by 20 seconds, despite driving with an injured arm after falling off both her jet ski and a mountain bike in the week before the event. 
Her pain was so bad that co-driver John Richardson was having to pull the handbrake lever for her. But the team were keeping it secret so that the Simonites didn't know that they had an advantage. Stephanie and Rachel, though, were already pushing as hard as their escort would take them, right behind Armstrong in 11th place. Jenny Davies at last avoided engine trouble in the Proton Compact and was able to demonstrate the car's true potential. Keep right, turn half and left over bump. Turn half and left over bump. Sadly, gearbox problems intervened. Both she and teammate Matt Anderson were out of the rally by the end of the second leg. Meanwhile, Alison McRae was in maximum fight-back mode after starting the morning 55th overall in the goal. Flat left, 17. Flat left and flat right, two crest. 30. Flat right, 30. Flat left at signs, 120. Right and turn square, left and right, pale. Rock outside. Into. Flat right. 100 flat crest, 50 narrows, flat left time, slide break in 30, turn medium left minus, 30. It was proving a wild ride for co-driver David Senior as McRae forced the golf back into the top 20. He even rearranged the straw bale chicanes to gain an extra second. Super 1600 Cup, Justin Dale in the Peugeot 106 Maxi was fighting the expected battle on the edge of the top 10 with the title winning Honda of Neil Weirden. Sadly though, a loose bolt in the engine will put the Peugeot out, leaving Weirden, who's now signed a contract for 1999 with Vauxhall, in control of his class. We had a good fight last night in the wet, in the dark. Um, this morning I really signed myself up, um, took a big chunk out of him on the first stage and then another chunk on the next one. So I had probably about 40, 50 seconds on him, and then unfortunately he's fallen by the wayside, so I have nobody to play with. Weirden's teammate next year, who to later was fifth. We had in the morning the trouble with the deep rental, and uh, it's uh, cost quite a lot of, lot of time, but uh, it's, uh, it took for us two, two stages, and now it's working very well, and, uh, and I'm quite confident for the car. Good news for the Vauxhall men, even better for Renault. Rose started the afternoon loop 29 seconds ahead of Evans. Right two and left two. Left three and right three. Forty. Left four plus. Fifty. Press forty. Right four. Slippy. One fifty. Left four over press. Slippy. Twenty. Left five. In. Slippy. Right four. 30, left, 6 through 4, 40. It was looking good for a win and the title. With half the rally still to go, the pressure was on and Evans had a problem. Go on then. Flat right. And 3 left. And 4 right sharp, 100. The clutch pedal's going to the floor. It's ineffective, so uh, we have to start the, start the stage on the start, you know, which is quite difficult. And obviously, Gwinda was really conscious of not stalling the car in the stage, otherwise, we'd have lost a bit, a bit more time. But um, we didn't have a bad run through the stage. Obviously, you don't need the clutch to change gear like an ordinary car. But um, hopefully, the boys are working out of it now and they can, they can get that fixed because obviously, it's, you do need a clutch. The clutch was fixed, but Evans was still in trouble. The Seat had now developed a misfire, and on every straight, there was frantic activity to cure it. You want to switch the cutoff off? No, it's on, huh? No, it's on. Change the fuel pumps. Switch that off. Switch the fuel pumps. Fuel pumps, leave that off. Right off, right. Like. Four right sharp, and right just from a crest, immediate eight left long. Evans was dropping back into third place, but there was worse to come. Basically, there was a tappety noise coming from the engine. It happened a couple of stages earlier, and um, we had to drop the pace down to try and preserve the engine, but uh, it wasn't a pain, unfortunately. 
<laughs> Delight for Renault, a one-two and the champion designate. Apparently Gwyneth stopped on the last stage, so um, even if we don't finish, we are British champions. So do, how does that affect the, the game plan now then? Um, I'm not sure. I think Renault need a car 12th or above at the end of the rally to clinch the manufacturers as well. Um, so obviously Tapio has been catching us up today. I'd like to get the go-ahead to try and win the rally because I think now if we don't finish the rally, um, we still win the championship. But obviously Renault are thinking of the manufacturers, so I'm not sure. There'll be discussions this evening, I'm sure. But Gwyndaf Evans wouldn't be the only driver drowning his sorrows in Douglas that night. Last year, as the home hero, Mark Higgins won the British Championship title here on the Manx. This year, Higgins had been in fourth place at the start of the second loop of the day, but he was also out of the event after clipping a wall and breaking the Nissan's back axle. Meanwhile, the Manx spectacle continued. Number 27, Derek McGarrity, was up to 10th place and fourth in the production cup, chasing Neil McShay on his first event in the Subaru. Stephanie Simonite was eighth, still chasing a ladies' cup rival, Barbara Armstrong, 37 seconds ahead. The spectacular Liam McCallaghan was sixth in the leading Ford, behind the production cup battle between David Mann in the Proton in fifth, and the class-leading Subaru, David Higgins, 40 seconds to the better in fourth overall. Yamakuta later would ride through Ramsey Harbour, happy with his third place. But that would be nothing to the delight in the Renault camp. After setting the fastest time on nine of the day's 12 stages, Tapia Laukonen was now just 22 seconds behind Rowe. And as Rowe headed the field, the team decided to let their drivers have some fun. Either driver would be allowed to take victory. The only team orders were, don't fall off the tarmac. A fascinating prospect in store for the final seven stages then. With both Renaults fighting for victory, the Subaru and Proton of Higgins and Mann fighting for the production cup, and the ladies' cup still could go to Scotland for Barbara Armstrong or to Yorkshire for the Simonites. Another perfect dawn for the final day of the event, and Martin Rowe was up early with the best of them. Then, just as if it was looking like a copybook finish, a big slide showed Rowe had a problem. All right down, black crest for 100. Right two through that 100. Well, about a mile to go, all right down. The experienced ringer slowed row to preserve the punctured tyre to the end of the stage, but over a minute had been lost, not just to Laukonen, but also to the flying Kutalato, the Astra setting the obvious fastest time on the Glenville stage. David Higgins, fourth overall, was another driver with gearbox trouble. But behind him, David Mann would find even more problems. The fifth place Proton closed to within half a minute of the class leader, but then rolled out of the event, luckily without injury. Alistair McRae, meanwhile, was back on the edge of the top ten after driving on one of the most spectacular events of the golf's long career. Right, and care medium left, points to minor, and open. 50 over bump. <laughs> the Scot had definitely found the limit of the golf's handling at the end of stage 18. Come on, boys! The board marking the stage finish was only a car's length away, but it took over a minute to manhandle a golf across the line. Back down again outside the top ten, it was a case to quote Robert the Bruce, of try, try again. Just uh, the last corner of the, the first stage this morning, we touched the gravel on the outside and slid off into the bog for a, a minute or so. Is it more spectacular in terms of mud rather than damage, or is Yeah, it... there's no, I mean, it's very soft, there's no damage to the car at all, it's just take everything off and clean it down, start again. Looks like it's going to be dry for at least this morning then, so another day of just sponsor obligations and tonk it as much as possible. Yeah, obviously I think there's a possibility to get into the top ten, so we're trying to do that but we're a bit of a setback. After all of this, you'd now expect Tapio Laukonen to be leading the rally, but think again. He was still 27 seconds behind Rowe, 
the Finn had problems of his own. We lost the third gear and then it's, it's uh, locking a front wheels when you're chasing down from the exit mode from fourth to third. So uh, that was one big moment when, when that happened. And, but even so, now we are in the service and I believe we can reach it. So we have still a long way to go and we haven't lost anything yet. The problem was a gearbox change on the Vagan normally takes 30 minutes. The time available at the Jerby service area was under 20. All of a sudden, from considering a 1-2 victory, the Renault mechanics were now racing to keep the Finn in the event. The expression on Laukonen's face says more than mere words as the final deadline looms. Now every second would count. Even if there seemed to be a few parts left over, the Renault mechanics had excelled, changing the gearbox in a record-breaking 16 minutes. Laukonen was still in the rally and, unpenalised, was still in his second place. Meanwhile, there'd still be celebration in the Sayat camp. Barbara Armstrong was now up to sixth overall and would clinch the Ladies' Cup title on the very next stage. Stephanie and Rachel Simonite had fought hard all the way in the escort, but the car told its own story after hitting a tree on the Baldoon special stage. The sisters dropped back to ninth place and they'll have to wait another year for their second Ladies' Cup title. Even including McRae's efforts, the driver of the rally must surely belong to Jeff Jones in the 1300cc Nissan Micra. 13th overall and winner of the Ferodo Super 1600 class. But things weren't going so well for Yamakutaleto in the third placed Astra. You don't need to be an expert in finish to understand that this means there are no gears left in the gearbox. It's a bitter blow for the Finn. He was fastest on the opening stage of the day and was closing on compatriot Laukonen. But his battle with the gear stick eventually got the car jammed into fifth gear to allow him to limp out of the stage after dropping to fourth place as a result. The British Junior Championship produced a dramatic rally-long battle between the Group N Astras of number 31, Rob Watson, and number 30, Stuart Eggleston. Eggleston eventually took class victory in 11th place overall by 24 seconds after snatching the lead on the final stage. But hot on their heels, running out of sequence after his gearbox change, Laukonen was back on the pace. Still second, four minutes behind Rowe. And up to third in all the dramas, David Higgins would be delighted with his result in the production cup car. He's now looking for a factory drive for outright honours next season. But ahead of them all, Martin Rowe and Derek Ringer were heading for victory. Last year, home hero Rowe won his first championship rally here on the Isle of Man. Now he's heading for a double. So a 1-2 for the Renault team. Higgins a fine third in the production cup car ahead of Kutaleto. Liam McCallaghan an equally strong fifth ahead of Alistair McRae fighting his way back to sixth ahead of the Ladies' Cup winner, Barbara Armstrong. And Martin Rowe is the champion by 11 points from Gwyndaf Evans with Alistair McRae third, Tapio Laukonen fourth, then Neil Weirden still fifth ahead of Yama Kutaleto. It was a close run thing in the Constructors' Championship, but Renault did it by a mere two and a half points from Seat with Volkswagen ahead of Ford who are just three points ahead of Vauxhall at the final chequered flag of the final event. So then, a clean sweep. Victory, the Drivers' Championship and the Constructors' title. A multiple celebration for Martin Rowe and the Renault team. And well, even if the champagne had gone a little bit to Derek Ringer's head, there is nobody in any doubt as to who the dream team of the 1998 season must have been. We just came here to beat Gwinda and to get the championship and it was a bonus winning the rally as well. Last night when you found out you were champion it was kind of not synced in also because there was still a job to be done. Is it, is it beginning to feel real yet? Um, it will do in a, in a while, yes, I'm sure. Barbara, we've been tempting fate on it but we can now say it. Ladies champion. I know, it's marvellous. It's nice feeling. What was it like then, the, the last few stages, nerve-wracking or just 
jobs to be done? No, it helped me a bit when Stephanie went off and lost two minutes earlier on this afternoon. So um, all I had to do was just drive at a sensible pace and um, make sure nothing happened to the car and just finish. Hey David, not only a uh, group and winner, but a podium place as well. Yeah, it's very special to get third place here on my home rally. It means more than last year when we had to drive out nice and slow and win the championship. So third place is my highest overall position to do it here on the tarmac as well, where the group end cars aren't expected to be so good. So we're, um, the whole team and everybody were all delighted. Two Manxmen on the podium, Rowan Higgins, one Finn and one great championship. Here's to next year.